Hello, son and daughter. Tonight, all are in for a real treat as old Tex will rustle up some of the spookiest stories from the hollers and hollers of these here hills. Grab your moonshine, huddle by the fire, and get ready for some good old-fashioned bone-chilling horror stories. Also, don't forget to subscribe and thus become part of our Texan family. Two years ago, I found myself on an elk hunting trip with three of my buddies. We had set up camp near Akaya, Oregon, or at least that's what I think it was. The days were spent scouting for elk, and the evenings were filled with laughter, storytelling, and of course, drinking screwdrivers around the campfire. One particular night, as we sat around the fire, we were all in high spirits, sharing our adventures from the day. Suddenly, out of nowhere, a loud, undulating scream echoed through the forest, cutting through our laughter and chilling us to the bone. It was unlike anything any of us had ever heard before, and it sent a wave of fear through the camp. Instinctively, we all jumped up and ran for our guns, our hearts pounding in our chests. The adrenaline coursed through our veins as we frantically scanned the dark woods surrounding the camp, trying to pinpoint the source of the terrifying sound. As we stood there, weapons at the ready, we caught a glimpse of a large, shadowy figure moving swiftly through the trees. The sheer size and speed of the creature was enough to make us believe that it was a Sasquatch, a creature we had all heard stories about but never truly believed in until that moment. Just as quickly as it had appeared, the creature vanished into the darkness, leaving us all standing there, dumbfounded and shaken. We gathered around the campfire once again, our previous mirth replaced by a sense of unease. We spent the rest of the night discussing the incident, trying to rationalize what we had experienced. Over time, the memory of that night has faded, but the feeling of fear and awe that the scream evoked still lingers. We've shared our story with others some of whom believe us, while others dismiss it as a product of our overactive imaginations and too many screwdrivers. The experience I'd like to share with you happened in the summer of 2002. I was 20, still living at home in a rental, in a rental in East Mesa, Arizona, with my 18-year-old brother and my mother. As you may know, Arizona has a typically six-month-long scorching, dry summer climate, and being a transplant from beautiful northern Cali, it was hard for us to adapt. Anyhow, and it was a hot summer night in late May or early June. My brother had just graduated high school, and I was working full-time during the day. We spent our evening talking and laughing and playing music. It really was a memorably enjoyable night. At about 10.30, I noticed that the front porch light had again burned out, as it had been doing for about 18 months prior to that. In fact, both of the lights over the driveway and three lights in our backyard were continually ceasing to function, and it seemed I was always buying bulbs and expensive strobe light bulbs. I don't know if this is somehow connected to what happened next, First, I must add that our front door was set back into the house with the garage protruding. Our front yard was much deeper than the backyard and was overshadowed by three velvet mesquite and a china berry tree and various species of kala cacti. So the street light did little to penetrate the den of darkness. I turned the lamplight to my bedroom, which was really an office nook right next to the front door, which had a large latticed picture window with run of the mill blinds. I opened the blinds and the light flooded the wall of the garage. What I saw made my skin crawl. There on the stucco wall was something. It was only about 10 to 12 feet from where I was standing. The only way to describe it was that it looked like a giant headless moth. I called my brother over excitedly. I clearly remember our conversation. What do you suppose that is? I have no idea. It must be a bat of some sort. But we only have micro bats here in Arizona. And I've always heard that bats hang upside down. I guess it could be a giant moth. We do live in the desert. I thought moths were attracted to light. The lights are all burnt out again. 
We talked for a moment and stood next to the glass panes adjacent to the front door, the bedroom light illuminating all the while, and the thing did not stir or move. We decided it was about 18 inches to 2 feet long from blunt top to wing bottom. It was very clear, yet very dark, almost black, and no antennae were visible. It hung on the wall like a moth, but was about the size of a medium-sized fruit bat, which I believe only exists in Asia. It was about five or six feet off the ground. My mother came and had a look and shuddered and refused to stand near the door. We were both young and curious, and my brother said, Let's go have a look at it then. We swung the door and security screen open, and he took a step over the door jamb. I was suddenly struck with an unreal, unearthly fear and grabbed his shoulder. He looked back at me and later said, I had the most wholly terrified look on my face that he had ever seen. I am afraid and tingly even writing this. Without a word, he stepped back inside and we locked both doors and closed the blinds and camped out in the living room, only going to sleep after several thoughtful conversations. The very next morning at sunrise, I went out to the wall with a tape measure, and my brother and mom stood at the door and directed me as to where and how high and how long this thing had been planted. There was no trace of anything. The dust on the stucco looked the same all around, with no residue or anything. When they were both satisfied with the positioning, I read the tape measure, 28 inches. My mother walked back into the house and has absolutely refused to speak of it since. My brother and I are both keenly interested in animal insect plant life via books and media, and I have taken a course in Southwest Biology, and neither of us has ever seen or heard of anything matching its description. My husband was raised here and said the only thing he could think of that size was an owl, but this was no owl. What was it? Perhaps it is a real animal we could not identify. Has someone had a similar experience or know what it could be? We are not exaggerating, people. We are level-headed and analytical. Thank you for your time. I never imagined the forest I patrolled could harbor such sinister secrets. My name is Alex and I was a park ranger stationed in a remote, dense forest known as Ravenwood. For years, I had been responsible for ensuring the safety of visitors and protecting the fragile ecosystem within its boundaries. Ravenwood was vast, ancient, and filled with mysteries, but nothing could have prepared me for the chilling events that unfolded deep within its heart. It all started one crisp autumn evening as I was concluding my rounds. The sun had already dipped below the horizon, casting long shadows among the towering trees. I was about to head back to my ranger station when I heard it, a soft, barely perceptible whisper that seemed to come from the very trees themselves. At first, I dismissed it as a trick of the wind, a figment of my fatigued imagination. But the voice persisted, growing stronger and more insistent with every step I took towards the source. It beckoned me deeper into the woods, its eerie, melodic tone drawing me in like a siren song. I couldn't resist the allure of those whispers, and I ventured further, guided solely by their spectral voices. My flashlight cut a narrow beam through the inky darkness, revealing gnarled roots and twisted branches that seemed to reach out for me. My footsteps were muffled by the thick carpet of fallen leaves, but the whispers were always there just ahead, just out of reach. Hours seemed to pass as I pressed on, the forest around me growing denser and more oppressive. The air grew cold, and an unnatural hush settled over the woods. It was as if nature itself held its breath, awaiting some terrible revelation. Finally, I reached a clearing deep within the forest, and there, bathed in the faint glow of the moonlight, I saw it. A colossal ancient tree, unlike any I'd ever encountered. Its massive roots writhed and twisted like serpents, and its branches loomed overhead like skeletal arms. The whispers grew more intense, swirling around me in a maddening crescendo. It was then that I realized the truth. These were not ordinary voices. They were the voices of the damned, the echoes of tormented souls that had become one with the forest. 
As I stood there, trembling with fear, the ground beneath me trembled, and the massive tree began to uproot itself, revealing a gaping black maw at its base. From that abyss emerged a nightmarish creature, an amalgamation of roots, earth, and shadow. Its hollow eyes locked onto mine, and I knew that I had uncovered a horrifying secret hidden for centuries. The creature's intentions were clear. It hungered for my soul, and it was a fate that countless others had met before me. With a surge of adrenaline, I turned and fled, the whispers of the forest now shrieking in rage as I distanced myself from the ancient malevolence. I ran faster than I ever had, guided only by the light of the moon and the distant beams of my flashlight. The forest seemed to conspire against me, its roots and branches reaching out to ensnare me but I was determined to escape the clutches of that eldritch horror. Hours later, I stumbled back into the safety of the ranger station, my heart pounding in my chest. I knew that I had uncovered a darkness that should have remained hidden, a secret that would haunt me for the rest of my days. I left Ravenwood never to return, haunted by the whispers that still echoed in my mind. The forest had revealed its malevolent secret to me, and... I had narrowly escaped its grasp, but I knew that Ravenwood would always be there, waiting for the next unsuspecting soul to venture too deep into its heart, and I could only hope that they would heed the warning of the haunted whispers and turn back before it was too late. It was a day like any other in Wyoming. As a park ranger, my job was as routine as it came, patrolling, maintaining, and ensuring the safety of the park's wildlife and visitors. My name's Bernie, by the way. That evening, I decided to take a walk through a cornfield. I often went ball hunting in my free time, so naturally, I had my bow and arrows with me. The cornfield was silent except for the rustle of the cornstalks dancing in the breeze. The sun was setting, casting long, eerie shadows that blanketed the field. Suddenly, I felt an odd sensation, like I wasn't alone. It was a primal instinct, that gut feeling of being watched. As I turned around, I came face to face with a huge creature that towered over me. I gasped, my heart pounding in my chest. The creature stood upright, like a man but covered in thick, matted hair. Its eyes were intense, almost human. I realized then that I was looking at what can only be described as Bigfoot. Fear gripped me, but instinct took over. I reached for my bow and let an arrow fly. It struck the creature square in the chest. With a monstrous roar, it fell to the ground. Slowly, I approached the fallen beast, my heart hammering in my chest. But as I neared, the body just vanished. One moment it was there, the next it was as if it had never existed at all. Dumbfounded and terrified, I sprinted back home. My wife, seeing the ashen color of my face, commented that I looked as white as a cloud. I could barely stammer out what had happened. That evening changed me. Every rustle in the trees, every shadow in the field. I wondered if the creature was watching. Years ago, I experienced something that still haunts me to this day. At the time, I was dating my abusive ex, though I was still deeply in love with him. It's difficult to admit now, but back then, I couldn't see the reality of our relationship. One day, we were sitting together on a bench in Yellowstone National Park, and I found myself laying in his lap while he gently ran his hand through my hair. I remember looking up at him and noticing something strange, as if there was something else present with us. Suddenly a piercing sound filled my ears, and for a brief moment I saw a demonic face overlapping my exes. The demon had horns and its flesh appeared rough, possibly burnt. Thick gray smoke swirled around it. It was only for a moment, but I saw the demon laughing, and I got you kind of laugh. It was utterly chilling. I've never experienced anything supernatural before or since that incident, and I had never even believed in demons until then. I don't discuss this encounter with many people for obvious reasons, but the memory remains vivid. 
One day, years after the incident, I was hiking in a national park, and I met a park ranger named Tom. After chatting for a while and feeling a sense of trust, I decided to share my eerie story with him. To my surprise, Tom told me that he had heard of similar experiences from other people who had visited the park over the years. He revealed that some people believed the park was haunted by dark energies that could manifest themselves in various ways. Tom's knowledge of these stories brought me a strange sense of comfort as it made me feel less alone in my experience. We continued to talk about the supernatural and shared other stories we had heard. By the end of our conversation, I felt a bond with Tom, and I was grateful to have met someone who could understand and validate what I had gone through. As I left the park that day, I couldn't help but wonder about the dark forces that might be lurking in the shadows, waiting to prey on unsuspecting victims. The park that I service gets little to no traffic anymore. Part of that is simply because of how small the town is. Another part of that is today's Americans just don't get out for the fresh air anymore. It's kind of sad, really. I see video games of the new fresh air of today and tablets and phones and electronics. A lot of them involve getting out into the wild and enjoying fresh air and hunting and surviving. Nobody is really into that anymore. People would rather literally pay money for a simulation. Then they could just go out themselves and do it. And yet, even as little traffic as our park gets, I still find just enough litter to make me irritated. As if people get out into nature just long enough to ruin it for everyone else. I was cleaning up some wrappers off a park bench when, among them, I noticed something different. There was one of these corn husk dolls. The kind that are fashioned after the type that Native Americans used to make. It didn't have a face, just a blank knob for a head and four nubs for arms and legs. Cute and creepy, I thought to myself, until I noticed a small piece of paper rolled up and tucked into one of its folds. I enrolled it out of curiosity, and it said, Hello there. I smirked and threw it. After I was done picking up all the trash, I went back to my patrol car. When there was another corn doll stuck behind the handle of the door, it too had another message that it read. I said hello. I kind of prickled and looked around. As far as I could tell, I was the only person in the park, and I hadn't seen or heard anyone. But then again, I was very absorbed in my work when I was picking up trash. It's possible that somebody was watching me and playing an elaborate prank just so they could do it for you know, giggles. Still, I didn't like to think that somebody had gotten by me like that. I quickly got inside my car, shut the door, and no sooner had I done that, I noticed a third doll sitting on my steering wheel, also having another note that said, Could you use a hand? I nearly soiled myself when something smacked into the windshield. It took a second to fully register, but I realized it was a severed arm in hand cut off at the elbow. Immediately, I radioed out that we had something going on in the park, and the response came fairly quick, as you would suggest and expect but I wasn't sure if it was soon enough to keep whoever this was inside the park. I brought everybody up to speed, and there was a very thorough sweeping. They didn't find anything. No body, no killer, nothing, not even another doll. Forensics even did tests on the severed arm, and unfortunately found that it belonged to a child that had been missing for over two months. The arm that hit my windshield is relatively fresh, so that meant the kid had died recently. The rest of the day kind of went by in a haze. I felt like a failure for not catching this monster in all the moments that I could have when he was tampering with my car. Again, we never found anything, and the person was never caught. It's a mystery that will always be left as just that, a mystery. As a park ranger, I'd have seen a lot of odd things in my time. We get people that come out here for all sorts of reasons, especially in the camping area when it's off-season. I've stumbled across all sorts of weird stuff. But so long as that weird stuff is legal and consensual, if you get my drift, then that's up to them. No judgment. Most of them can't even look you in the eye the next morning. And we just have a small chuckle about that. As I said, if you are consenting adults, it's your own business. 
But one time I came across something that ended up being a police investigation. You see, I was out and about performing one of the last evening patrols before heading home for the night. We had three tents booked in that night, and it was getting towards winter when the camping area would be closed. Two couples had appeared, and one family with a mother, dad, and two small babies. The tents were fairly spaced out, and just before midnight, everything was quiet. I just finished up heading back to the office to sign off when I saw a young girl, probably no older than 18, run past me. She was just in her underwear, and from the quick flash I saw of her face before running off to the trees, she was terrified, all wide in mouth, ready to scream. Immediately, I turned around, shining my flashlight in the direction she'd ran off to. There was nothing. I headed that way and looked all around, calling out even. Nothing. I recalled the three ladies that were booked into the campsite. They were all older. The mom was likely in her later thirties, and the two women and the couples were around their mid-twenties, I would think. There was no good reason for a young girl to be running around in the dead of night when it was freezing cold. So I went through protocol and alerted colleagues and police. They headed out and conducted a more thorough search, woke the campers who were not happy that the babies had been disturbed, but there was no trace, literally no trace. I'm talking zero footprints where I'd seen her. No apparent way in or out that showed any evidence somebody had even ran through here, and no reports of missing teen girls or bodies showing up. I was relieved, but at the same time not exactly sure what I saw. It did leave the question of what the hell did I see, or did I possibly hallucinate it? I guess time will tell. So recently, May, my wife, and the rest of the family that lives with us have been hearing and or smelling strange sounds. At first, we thought it was the stray cats or raccoons. But then things started getting weirder. We started hearing sounds. Sometimes it would be footsteps. Other times we would hear knocking. We thought maybe we smoked a bit too much of the devil's lettuce. But everyone else in the house was also hearing these things. That's when the sound started sounding like people talking to us, but the weird thing was it always sounds like they are incredibly far away. The most recent thing was the smell of a rotten corpse of some kind, but I couldn't for the life of me remember when I last smelled a corpse like that. The smell seemed almost intense as if it were right in front of me. I checked around our home and under it to make sure there were no dead animals. This happened at almost twelve at night. When my wife and I were outside smoking, I had my brother come out and check, and even he agreed that it wasn't just me who smelled it. He said it smells like a corpse of person. That's when I remembered why the smell seemed so familiar, because a man had died a few years ago, and I remember how many times we walked by his corpse. They realized he died inside the wall, but I never forgot the smell. It was a very horrid smell. Still... That smell only has happened once, and it hasn't come back that I know of. I'm usually one to think of scientific reasons. I ended up checking if any possible sewage had leaked from a pipe or if it came from our neighbor's home, but nothing seemed out of the ordinary. These weird happenings only seem to happen at night, and most of the people who live near us are usually asleep by 10 p.m., and we stay up till about 12 or 1 in the morning. My neighbors have told me that on the few occasions they have been outside at that hour, they say they feel uncomfortable or they hear something, but they chalk up to maybe the random animals or them being tired. I'll post an update if anything significant happens. I would also like any opinions or theories to know what it might be. My name is Alex, and I'm an experienced park ranger with years of service under my belt. I never could have imagined the terrifying ordeal that awaited me when I agreed to lead a team of scientists and archaeologists on an expedition to study an ancient Native American settlement in a remote, uncharted area of the National Park. As we delved deeper into the ruins, the atmosphere grew heavy with a palpable sense of history. The settlement was remarkably well-preserved, 
a testament to the ingenuity of the people who had once called it home. But as we continued our exploration, we stumbled upon a horrifying scene. The bodies of over 50 people, all brutally slaughtered. It soon became apparent that the settlement had been ravaged by a long, dormant supernatural creature, a wendigo that killed people on sight. The mere mention of its name sent shivers down our spines, and we knew that we had to find a way to stop the creature before it could wreak further havoc. As we searched for answers, we found a series of runes etched into the walls of a hidden cave. The symbols told the story of the Wendigo, its origins, and most importantly, the method to banish it from this world. With no time to lose, we worked together to decipher the runes and perform the ritual needed to rid the world of the Wendigo. The air crackled with energy as we recited the ancient incantation, and the Wendigo let out a blood-curdling scream that echoed throughout the settlement. As the creature writhed in agony, it finally vanished, banished from this realm by the power of the ancient magic. But as we stood at among the ruins, our relief was tempered by the knowledge that we were too late to save the lives of those who had fallen victim to the Wendigo's wrath. The settlement, once a thriving community, now stood as a haunting testament to the dark forces that had brought about its demise. As we returned to the park, the weight of our discovery weighed heavily upon us. The ancient settlement and the tragic fate of its inhabitants would remain a somber reminder of the mysteries that lay hidden within the depths of the national park and the darkness that sometimes lurked just beneath the surface of our world. It happened five years ago. The official ruling was that his death was caused by a rogue bear attack. You know, when a bear gets a little too used to eating human food so it doesn't feel threatened anymore, and attacks a human. They all know it wasn't a bear, though. Bears don't leave wounds like that. And they sure as hell don't pose the body 70 feet up in a dead tree. Yeah, I said pose, but before I get into the details, I should explain a bit about myself. Now, I'm a park ranger in a very popular national park in the northern United States. I don't want to say exactly which one, although I doubt I'll keep my job for much longer. Anyway, that's partially why I'm posting this. I need to tell somebody else about this story, and like I said, my colleagues don't want to talk about it. Being a park ranger has given me a lot of weird stories, and everybody is used to weird happening in the woods. But this was on a completely different level. For days, we had been getting reports from campers and hikers about strange noises coming from a section of deep backcountry forests. Growls yipping, even human. Sounding voices. Equipment and food had been going missing from backcountry campgrounds. All pretty typical stuff that can be explained away pretty easily. Many animals thieve food, make weird noises. And even the human voices can be explained by the sound that foxes and mountain lions make at night. But we needed to investigate either way because an animal that is conditioned to human food is dangerous. So we sent our veteran backcountry ranger, Craig McKay. This guy had been working there for 30 years, was an expert outdoorsman, and was my mentor when I first started. As always, he jumped into the task always eager to go into the backcountry, even though he was getting a little older. I'll pause now and let Craig tell the rest of the story. Well, his journal will have to tell the rest of the story because he isn't alive to tell it. I found his journal, a flashlight in his backpack, inside a small cave near the location of his body. A couple of days after he didn't return, and we had sent out a search party to find him. I haven't shared this journal with anyone, not even the other rangers until now. I'm not exactly sure why I've kept it hidden. Other than that, the truth seems so messed up and unreal. I didn't want it to damage people's memory of Craig. I'm not even sure if I believe it myself. Everything I'm going to read to you, he had written down over the two days he was out on his backcountry excursion. October 21st, 2011, Day 1. Today was a long day, and I can't say that I've made much progress. I've hiked about 15 miles over the course of the day, starting down in the gully, where the reports first started and ending up at my current camp, which is on the southwest side of Bald Knob. 
I figure it's a good enough place to keep an eye out for anything coming and going through the valley. Earlier, I found some tracks in the ground in the area, and as close as I can tell, they're from a mountain goat. Odd that it would travel alone, but maybe it was separated from its herd or dying. It had an odd gait. I followed them for a while, but they didn't lead anywhere, so I abandoned them. Near the tracks was a pervasive smell of death, and I'm assuming a goat got separated and died. Tomorrow I'm planning to hike across the valley to the mountain on the opposite side and see if I can't catch a track of whatever is harassing the campers. October 22nd, 2011, morning of day two. Quick note while I eat breakfast. Last night was a long night, one of the longest I've had in a while. About an hour after going to bed, I heard light steps near the campsite. I grabbed the rifle and went out to investigate. No lights so my eyes could stay adjusted to the dark. The second I stepped out of my tent, the noise stopped. Whatever was there knew that I was watching. I made a couple of circles around the campsite and found nothing, but I could feel something watching me from the shadows. As I got back into my tent, I thought I saw a tall silhouette in the clearing, but I must have just been seeing things. It was too skinny to be a bear, and nothing else is that tall. The strong scent of death was still present and kept me wary all night. Today's mission has changed. I just got a radio call that a couple of hikers haven't returned when they were supposed to last night and might be lost. I'm still crossing the valley today, but this time to reach where the hikers were supposed to be. Last October 22nd, 2011, night of day two. Stop for the night in the valley cooking dinner now. Chicken and rice again. Dead tired and I'm getting too old for this. No progress on the hikers and still smells like death, though much stronger than before. I've just heard some sounds that sound like they could be voices. I can't get the radio to work in this valley. Looks like I'm not getting dinner tonight after all. Going to take a light pack and see if I can follow these voices. October 22nd, 2011, night of day two. Second entry scribbled. Dear God, what did I find? Barely made it to this cave. I can hear it scratching and gurgling outside. Going to try and block the entrance and see if I could stay here overnight. I found out where the smell of death came from. Got the cave entrance cracked, covered with a large rock and some brush. It will have to do. The beast is still outside, clawing at the crack in the rock. Don't think I'll sleep tonight anyway. Not after what I saw. I might as well record this because these might be my last words. For the first time in my career, I'm scared. I don't even know what I saw. It was huge, about seven and a half feet tall and possibly fast. Smells like putrid meat. Earlier, when I left camp, the voices outside became more and more persistent. They were definitely human voices. I followed them until I reached the clearing and suddenly everything went silent. No voices, no hikers. It sounded like the forest itself was holding its breath. I heard a slight sound behind me before I was thrown off my feet. Knocked the wind out of me. My rifle was ripped from my hand before I could even use it. I was picked up by my leg and thrown across the clearing. I could feel its claws digging like knives into my muscle. The thing dragged me up right against the tree, and I could feel its breath on my neck, breathing out a putrid smell. I could feel the blood pouring from my leg and soaking into my pants. The agonizing pain from the wound left me trembling. I could feel the weight of its body as it pushed up against me, ready to go in for the kill. I heard the smack of its mouth opening and prepared myself to die when a crash in the distance distracted the beast, long enough for me to make a break for it. I ran for my life and I didn't look back, but knew it wasn't far behind me. About twenty feet away was the entry to this cave that I was able to squeeze into. It's still outside. I could hear it shuffling around trying to get into the crack, and I could hear the heavy breathing, the sucking gasping sound coming from its mouth. I have no idea what I'm going to do. Dear God, please help me out of this. I want to see my wife again. I want to see my kids again. My nose is filled with the putrid smell of impending death. If I make it through the night, my plan is to wait until first light and try to escape back to the ranger station. Those are the last words we have by Craig McKay.
When he never reported back, we assumed his radio had gone out of range. But after a couple of days, we sent a search party to find him. Well, we found him all right. From the tracks, it looks like Craig left the cave early the next day. He makes it about 50 feet from the cave entrance when a second set of tracks catches up to him. Goat tracks more specifically, a goat with only two legs. The gait matches something that would be a bit more than seven feet, like Craig described in his journal. What we found of Craig was dragged 70 feet up a nearby tree and torn to pieces. He was hardly recognizable. His torso was jammed onto a short branch on the tree that kept him hanging there, his arms splayed out to his sides. His innards were strewn around the base of the tree. The jagged shadow remains of his leg bones stuck out of the early snowfall that had come to the mountains this year. Nothing appeared eaten or missing, but not a single piece of him was left untouched by the monster. It took the rest of the day in a special rope team to get him down. The missing hikers were never found. Those scraps of clothing matching what they were wearing have been found in the same valley where Craig died. Like I said earlier, the official story is a bear attack. Bears don't do this. We don't know what did this. We've rerouted trails to stay away from this area, but we still hear reports of human sending voices coming from the woods. And we've had some more hikers than normal go missing in the last five years. They are found, but it's always too late. Some are arranged like Craig was. Broken warnings to other hikers who dare intrude upon the beast's forest. Some are just never seen again. My name is John, a seasoned park ranger assigned to mentor a rookie named Ethan. On his first assignment, we ventured deep into the remote backcountry of the vast national park, eager to pass on my knowledge and experience. Little did I know, our routine patrol would quickly become a harrowing fight for survival. We stumbled upon a series of gruesome animal killings that defied any logical explanation. The carcasses were left in a manner that suggested no known predator was responsible. As we investigated further, we discovered the existence of a pack of supernatural predators that could blend into the shadows, moving silently and unseen. These creatures were unlike anything we'd ever encountered, and their mere presence sent a chill down our spines. Ethan and I knew we had to overcome our fears and rely on our skills to outwit these elusive predators. Our priority was to alert the public to the danger lurking within the park's borders, but we knew we needed to act fast. We devised a plan to lure the creatures into a trap, using our knowledge of the terrain and animal behavior to our advantage. Unfortunately, our plan did not go as smoothly as we had hoped. As we managed to ensnare the predators in our carefully laid traps, Ethan became separated from me. I heard him cry out and my heart sank as I realized that my young protege had fallen victim to the creatures we were trying to stop. Despite the pain and guilt that weighed heavily upon me, I pressed on capturing the remaining predators. As I stood there mourning the loss of Ethan, a government helicopter suddenly arrived. Before I could react, a group of armed agents emerged and locked me in, taking the captured predators with them. I demanded answers, but my pleas fell on deaf ears. The helicopter took off, leaving me with a sinking feeling that I would never learn the truth about the creatures or the government's involvement. After that day, no one ever saw or heard from me again. My disappearance became one of the many mysteries that haunted the park, a chilling reminder of the unknown dangers lurking in the shadows. I remember back in high school, my religion teacher shared some jaw, dropping stories with us. He claimed to have worked as an assistant to the local exorcist involved in intense spiritual battles against the forces of darkness. It was an unexpected twist in our religious education, but it certainly grabbed our attention. He recounted encounters where he had direct conversations with the devil himself. These exchanges were chilling and unsettling as he described the cunning and manipulative nature of the fallen angel, 
The things he heard during those interactions would send shivers down our spines. But it did stop there. My teacher went on to describe the physical manifestations that accompanied these exorcisms. He spoke of furniture being violently thrown across the room as if an invisible force was wreaking havoc. The intensity of these encounters was like something out of a horror movie. What intrigued us even more was the revelation that most of the people who required exorcism were practitioners of Satanism. It seemed that their involvement in dark rituals and worshipping the devil had invited malevolent entities into their lives. As unsettling as it was to hear, it reinforced the importance of spiritual discernment and the need for protection against evil influences. Those stories stayed with me long after high school. They challenged my beliefs and made me question the existence of supernatural forces. While I couldn't fully comprehend or verify the authenticity of my teacher's experiences, they served as a reminder of the constant struggle between good and evil that transcends the boundaries of our physical world. Whether or not one believes in the paranormal, these stories opened up discussions and expanded our understanding of faith, spirituality, and the power of belief. It was a unique and unforgettable chapter in my high school experience where the lines between reality and the supernatural blurred, leaving us with more questions than answers. This happened nine years ago in the early spring when I was 15 years old, spring 2014. I was at a friend's house in corn country about an hour north of Indianapolis. Nowadays, I am very familiar with the paranormal unexplained, having multiple shared experiences with friends, but at the time I was a major skeptic. I didn't fully process what we saw until years later. I came over to my friend's house to hang out like any other time. I brought my pellet gun, he had one as well, so we could shoot some moles on his farm property. After a while, his brother joined us, and we eventually got bored of looking for moles. There was a patch of woods about the size of two football fields, a little over a mile away, completely surrounded by empty cornfields with no access points from the nearby road. The three of us decided to walk out there, because why not? We were bored kids looking for fun. We put on some boots and headed out with our pellet guns. The walk wasn't super far, but it took us a while to reach the woods because all the spring rain from earlier in the week made the empty field a big mud pit. So muddy, your foot disappears with each step. Then right as we walked through the brush surrounding the edge of the woods, we saw it. The best way I can describe this thing is it was a raccoon that was built like a Great Dane. We had seen coyotes and wolves before, and this was not that. It 100% looked like the biggest raccoon we had ever seen. We could tell we caught it off guard because it was just standing there on all fours grooming itself. And then it immediately locked eyes with us when one of us pointed at it and said, Look at that thing. There were a couple of seconds where we just looked at it as it looked back at us before it quickly turned around and scaled a 60 feet tree. We lost sight of it in the canopy. We then looked at each other and were like, WTF was that. We talked about how the way it climbed the tree was what freaked us out the most. It only took a few strides up the tree, using its front two paws to grab a spot on the tree to lift and launch itself up the tree. The arms were freakishly long and lanky looking when it climbed. It honestly looked somewhat human in the way it articulated its arms as it climbed, like its elbows jutted out to the sides as it pulled itself up. We talked about how freaky that was some more and decided to keep looking around because even though we were spooked, it was intriguing and we wanted to see if there was any other freaky stuff around. There definitely was. The woods were littered with easily over 100 animal carcasses, bone piles. Most of them were cows, raccoons, and opossums. There was one spot, maybe 25 by 25 feet, that had at least a dozen cow carcasses ranging from just the bone left to one that looked less than a week old. They were definitely being eaten by something with huge chunks of flesh missing. I know cows get loose all the time, but damn if this didn't look like a feeding spot. 
My theory is this thing was stealing cows from local farms for food. There are a couple within five miles. We also found a man, made small pond near the middle of the woods, which couldn't have been more than six feet wide. A shovel and plastic bucket was sitting next to it. Once we found that, we're pretty freaked out again and decided we'd better head back because we had less than two hours of daylight left and there was a lot of thick, deep mud to slowly walk through to get back. That's pretty much it. At the time, it freaked me out a bit, but looking back now, knowing what skinwalkers are, I'm just happy we came back completely unscathed. Unfortunately, I don't hang out with those guys anymore, and I tried to go back with some different friends, somewhat recently only to see that the woods had been cleared out, and there was nothing there. I thought I was tripping out, but I looked on Google Earth, and I could see in its place was dirt and log piles. Probably an omen to not chase this thing. I'll take it at face value. I haven't heard of the dogman, but this thing didn't look like a dog coyote at all. I just used Great Dane as a size comparison as it was freakishly large to be looking like a raccoon. Yes, it had a striped tail like a raccoon. It had the face of a raccoon, specifically the large black spots around its eyes. Stubby, almost rounded ears like a raccoon. It had bushy fur like a raccoon. We saw it very clearly with no obstructions from about 30, 40 feet away. It was early spring, and the brush inside the canopy was still dead. I used to hunt in Leon County at my family's old homestead that has been around since the late 1800s. The uh, frame house that my grandmother was born in is still standing. It was built in 1920, I believe, and I would drive in from College Waco and spend the night while hunting down there. We were always scared to be alone in that house just because of all the old furniture and pictures, etc. I fell asleep on the couch one night when a norther was blowing through. I remember awaking briefly, thinking it had gotten cold, but fell right back to sleep. In the morning when I woke up, I had an old quilt draped over me. This was not a quilt that would have just been draped over the couch. In fact, my mother confirmed later that she had that quilt put up in a closet. It sounds crazy, but I have no other explanation. I had no recollection of ever getting up. I'm a believer in guardian angles, and that is all I can sum this experience up to. Needless to say, it was several years before I stomached up the nerve to sleep alone in that house again. My mom, dad, and cousin each have a story that take place on the same patch of road in Mexico. I'll tell them as they were relayed to me individually. My parents actually met here in the United States, but they grew up in neighboring pueblos in Mexico. Connecting the two pueblos is a long, empty span of road, maybe five miles. Long, which is apparently haunted. These stories take place many years apart, but on the exact same patch of road. When my dad was a young man, he loved horses, jerry pills, and drinking. While he has since put down the bottle, he still loves horses and jerry pills, low, but back in the day, he would occasionally ride his horse out across the road to the neighboring Pueblo to hang out or hit up some parties. One early morning, he was returning home on horseback from a party in the neighboring Pueblo. He was a bit drunk and was just casually making his way home when suddenly the air grew still and the night went silent. He said something just felt off and his horse could sense it as well. My dad says that you can always tell what a horse is focusing on by looking at their ears and in this case my dad's horse's ears were perked up stiff and focusing at the empty field beside them as well as all around them thinking that there might be some sort of animal stalking them. My dad looked around, but the fields beside them were empty and there weren't any bushes or things for an animal to hide behind. Suddenly the air went cold and my dad felt goosebumps on the back of his neck, almost as if something was right behind him. That's when my dad's horse couldn't take it anymore and took off running for its life. My dad held on tightly and tried several times to bring the horse to a stop, 
but it was dead set on getting the hell away from whatever they had just encountered. Eventually, they finally reached their pueblo, and the horse calmed down and came to stop. Never before or after had the horse behaved that way, and it left my dad shook up. Needless to say, he was sober by the time he reached home. Me, my uncle, and my cousins went to this site to hunt deer. We lined up six abreast on the far side of the trench to push any deer out. As we walked along, I inadvertently got forced down into the trench. I then kept with the direction of the trench. After a short time, I smelled something. It smelled like some stinking animal. Then I heard it running back and forth as if frantically looking for something. I could tell by the sound it was two-legged. I could feel the ground shake like when a herd of elk gets spooked. At this point, I hear a tree maybe six to ten inches on the stump come crashing to the ground behind me. At this point, I made extreme haste for the walls of the trench. Pulling on vines, I made my way out and straight for our vehicles. I did not linger at the trench for further investigation. From all of my experience in the woods, I can, with full confidence, say what I encountered was not a bear and was definitely two-legged. Hiking with a companion and two German shepherds around 9 a.m. in the Rogumpqua wilderness, saw a large brown object moving fast through the understory, which was quite thick. Dogs chased the object. Both dogs had saddle packs. One dog had a tarp, which was securely rolled and tied on the middle of his back. Dogs were gone about three, five minutes and came running back. One dog, which had the tarp on return, and continued to run past us and ended up at the shelter, about one mile back where we had saved the night and was extremely scared. The other older dog stopped when encountering us and listened when we told it to stop, but was also very scared. Several things were unusual, the intense musty smell, something like a bull elk in heat, but not or not like a bear either. The dogs fear as they have chased bears, coyotes, deer, elk, and are never scared upon return. The tallness of the object as it was way too tall for a bear or elk. Too quiet for an elk also. The untied tarp which was securely tied, but upon return of the chase, the tarp was tied but just one knot. I tag good knots. As Lorna Park Ranger of the Green Lakes National Park, my days were usually filled with the routine tasks of patrolling and maintaining the park. But that particular evening was different. I had been off duty, indulging in a spot of elk hunting near the old growth, an area dense with towering trees that had seen centuries pass by. The sun was gently sinking, painting the sky in hues of orange and purple. It was my favorite time of the day in the park a time when the hustle of the day eased and the nocturnal orchestra started tuning up. The first scream pierced the peaceful dusk like a shard of glass. It was long, chilling, and unlike anything I'd ever heard in the park. My heart pounded in my chest as I tried to decipher the source. It sounded distant, past a clear cut some two hundred yards away. I gripped my hunting rifle tighter, my senses on high alert. The second scream came, then the third, each roughly five to six seconds long and spaced out over a span of ten minutes. The sounds were loud, almost deafening, echoing through the otherwise quiet forest. It felt as if the forest held its breath, the usual chirping of birds and rustling of leaves replaced by an eerie silence. What intrigued me was not just the volume or the frequency of the screams, but the pattern. It was as if whatever was making the sound was trying to communicate. The screams had a certain rhythm to them, an odd cadence that sounded like a kitty. As a park ranger, I was familiar with the cries and calls of the park's wildlife. But this was something new, something foreign. Every instinct told me to retreat to get to the safety of the ranger station, but my curiosity pushed me forward. I moved stealthily, my boots crunching softly against the forest floor. The screams had stopped, replaced by an unsettling silence. 
I felt the hair on the back of my neck stand up, a primal part of me acknowledging the unknown. As I neared the source of the sound, I took a deep breath, preparing myself for whatever was out there. The twilight had given way to the moon's pale glow, casting long, ominous shadows between the trees. I squinted, trying to make out any movement, but the forest stood still, as if it were holding its breath. Then, just as I was about to turn back, I saw it. In the clearing, bathed in the moonlight, was a creature. It was unlike anything I had seen before, a being straight out of a folk tale. As our eyes met, it let out a scream, the same chilling, ah, kitty, that had led me here. I held my breath, my grip on the rifle tightening. That night I came face to face with the unknown, and it changed my perspective forever. The park was not just a job anymore. It was a land of mysteries waiting to be discovered, and I was its custodian. Last year, I was with a buddy of mine, and we were going to do the Hart Creek Scramble in Alberta, but due to some health conditions he has, it was going too strenuous to complete, and we figured we'd make it an easy day and just do the simple trail. Now we're both climbers and have been to Hart Creek for rock climbing in the past and had a great time, so it wasn't a surprise to see the sporadic climbers on the mountainside as we went. Hart Creek is also pretty popular and easy for people who just want to go for a nice nature walk and maybe have picnic. Anyway, so we walked in, enjoying the day, watching climbers on our way by. We saw a couple even doing some multi-pitch climbing, which means basically leap frogging up the route. We settled in for lunch about a half hour later and left a couple hours after that. On our way back, I remember seeing a climbing shoe in the creek and thinking... Oh, someone must have lost this. I picked it up when my buddy got my attention and I looked further downstream. Both climbers, a young man, 29 or so, I learned later, and his partner were both lying the creek bed, rope and harnesses still attached, dead. It was very surreal. We had seen these people climbing not two hours before, making their calls, having a good time. The first reaction I had was that I remembered that there was a family right behind us, a husband and wife with a young daughter who were playing in the creek on the way down. We ran back and stopped them and explained as quietly as we could what was ahead, and before we knew it, looky, Luz had come back. It turned out that the husband was an off-duty RCMP officer, and so he took control of the situation. I learned later we weren't the first on scene and that the authorities had been called. It was a very quiet ride back into town that day, though. Edit. I have more details if people are interested. Real edit. Holy crap, sorry, all. Okay, more details, so the couple who were climbing were both experienced enough, but one was still learning they attempted to do a dual lowering maneuver using each other's weight and feeding the rope through their belays. One of them made a mistake and lost their end of the rope, and that was it for both of them. There wasn't a lot of blood, strangely, and they looked very peaceful. I didn't get a good look at the girl. I mostly only saw the guy there. The story ran for a couple days in the area, talking about the male as the family of the girl didn't want to disclose anything. That was not something I thought I'd see that day, that's for sure. I'm going to peruse the comments for any specific questions. This is a story my uncle told us when he was younger, and my cousin was just some months old. I was around 15 or so. He was explaining it to my father and looked actually scared about it. For what he told my father and I heard there myself, he had been dreaming three, four times with the same old woman and his daughter. The woman had bright red eyes, and in all his dreams she heard his baby one way or another. So just a nightmare which sucked, but whatever. Some days later, they go around town with their baby and took some photos. And when a couple of weeks later, my uncle went to get them developed, he got a nasty surprise. In one of the photos of just the baby playing on some grass, there was an old woman at the background. The light had made it so she had red eyes, and my uncle sworn up and down it was the same woman that appeared in his dreams.
and then his wife pipped in that indeed there was something strange there, because she could have sworn they were alone in the park while taking those photos. She didn't seem to believe it was that scary, but she hadn't noticed the woman at all, she said. They spent a week or so staying with us until my uncle decided it was his imagination, and they went back home. Two years later, his wife tried to kill him while he was sleeping with a knife and tried to go after their daughter, but that didn't have anything to do with it. Turns out having schizophrenia, not saying anything to your boyfriend, even when he turns into your husband, stopping taking your meds and your whole family deciding to lie to that same husband. Saying you were perfectly fine is not a good idea. Lived alone in a sub-basement, flat once. A lot of weird things happened that I put down to the fact I was constantly tired from working split shifts, six days a week. Honestly, if it was something else, it was actually super helpful. I'd come home knowing I really needed to put a clothes wash on, and when I got in, I'd find my clothes were clean. That kind of thing, but it was happening a lot. I really thought that my schedule was so messed up that I was doing things and not remembering doing them, so I was more concerned that I was losing my mind than being haunted. Anyway, the thing I really can't explain away is the time I was lying on my couch and I noticed something catching the light on a glass panel on the door. Got up to look at it and saw it was a kiss mark. But basically, from that moment on, I was finding them all over the place, on mirrors, on the other doors, even on the stovetop, basically any shiny surface. I may have been washing clothes without remembering, but I definitely wasn't going around kissing things in my flat. Oh, and also, I would often find my front door wide open, despite being sure that I'd locked it or at least shut it, which made me think that maybe a living human was getting into my place and doing weird shit. Here's what happened. I was at work one day when my co-workers started talking about a strange creature he had seen. Curiosity peaked. I asked him to describe the creature in detail. As he told me about it, I couldn't help but think it sounded familiar. I pulled up a picture of the Mothman on my phone and showed it to him, asking if the creature he saw looked anything like that. To my surprise, he said it did. Intrigued, I asked him to contact his friends who had been with him during the sighting and show them the picture as well. They all separately confirmed that what they saw looked exactly like the Mothman. My co-worker then recounted the entire story. Two years ago, in the city of Wilmington, California, near a massive ARCO refinery, my co-worker and three of his friends were hanging out in his backyard at around 2 a.m., one of them happened to look up and spotted a winged creature flying above them. He said it didn't do anything out of the ordinary, but it circled their group about five times before heading north toward the city of Torrance, where the Los Angeles International Airport is located. He added that they saw the creature again later that night, at around 4.35 a.m. This time it repeated its circling behavior, but only went around them two or three times before flying off towards the city of Long Beach. They never saw the creature again after that. My co-worker then mentioned that he thought he might have seen the Mothman again a week later, but he wasn't entirely sure, so he didn't provide any further details. The story left me feeling both fascinated and uneasy. The Mothman, a creature of urban legend, had always been something I read about, but never truly believed in. However, hearing my co-worker's account and the corroborations from his friends, I couldn't help but wonder if there was some truth to the legend. What was this winged creature that had appeared in Wilmington, and why was it circling my co-worker and his friends? I found myself looking up into the sky more often, scanning the horizon for any sign of the mysterious creature. The possibility that the Mothman was real sent a shiver down my spine, and I couldn't help but feel that the world was filled with more mysteries than I could ever truly comprehend. Several years ago, my friend Charlie and I embarked on a hiking trip to the breathtaking canyons of New Mexico. 
We were drawn by the promise of untouched landscapes and the sheer thrill of adventure. Little did we know we were about to encounter something that would change our perception of reality forever. It was our third day on the trail. We were in a remote part of the canyon, miles away from civilization. The sun was beginning to set, casting long shadows across the rugged terrain. We decided to set up camp near the base of a towering cliff. As we were collecting firewood, Charlie suddenly froze. He pointed towards a spot on the cliff face. I squinted, trying to make out what he was pointing at. Then I saw it. A figure, pitch black, almost blending with the shadows. It was thin, unnaturally so, with long arms ending in what seemed to be claws. Its skin had an unnatural shiny black sheen, like it was coated in an oil slick. We stood there frozen, watching as it scaled the cliff with an agility that was both mesmerizing and terrifying. It moved like some sort of grotesque, twisted parody of Spider-Man, its long limbs contorting in ways that seemed impossible. Suddenly it stopped. Its head turned, and I felt a cold shiver run down my spine. It had noticed us. For a moment it seemed to consider us, its form eerily still, against the cliff face. Then, with a speed that made my heart pound in my chest, it scurried up the cliff and disappeared into the darkness. Charlie and I were left standing in stunned silence, the echoes of our encounter lingering in the air. We quickly decided to move camp, neither of us comfortable sleeping so close to the creature's haunt. To this day, we refer to that encounter as our Black Spider Man. I was hiking in the Catskills. I live in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, but I come up to the Catskills fairly regularly throughout the year because sometimes the Poconos just get a little boring. I started at the trail head parking lot where I parked my car and began walking up the same trail that I've walked up 1,000 times. After about an hour, I started to feel kind of weird. It felt like the woods were a little bit quieter than they usually were when I had come up here before, but I wasn't initially very concerned about it. After I sat down to have breakfast, I started hearing rustling above me, and some sticks fell down right behind me. I wasn't really worried about this either, as I just assumed it was some squirrels running around or some chipmunks throwing things at me. This has happened to me before. I finished my breakfast without incident and kept walking toward the summit. This was fairly early in the morning, around 6 a.m., so I would think there would be a lot of birds chirping and a lot of other activity, but things just kept getting quieter and quieter as I ascended. This definitely creeped me out, but I tried to push it out of my mind because I've already been hiking for a while at this point, and I'm definitely not turning around. Eventually, more sticks fell to my right, somewhat close to me, and they sounded heavier. These were at the kind of small twigs that would generally fall from squirrel activity. I went over and checked them, and these were fairly substantial. This continued to happen in a higher frequency until I finally reached the end of the trail. On my way back, it happened continuously, increasing in frequency as I descended, until suddenly it just kind of stopped when I was about a mile from the car. When I finally returned to my car, I found all of the doors open and it seemed like a lot of my stuff had been very violently rummaged through. I had a bag in there with some of my clothes in it, and this had been torn up. A lot of my clothes were outside of the car, leading back into the woods. I thought about calling the police, but I live in Philadelphia, so I knew there wasn't really anything that was going to happen. To this day, I still get freaked out when I think about it. I don't necessarily think it was connected, but I do feel really uneasy about both of these things happening at the same time. Then again, maybe I was just robbed. Fiance claims she heard someone yelling help from the woods. To give some perspective on the scenario, we live in an apartment complex at the edge of town in Illinois. Right next to us is a woodsy area full of coyotes and deer, and lots of birds, so it's pretty lively. Last night at 3 a.m., she went outside to grab a case of water from the trunk of our car, and when she was grabbing it, she claimed she heard someone say hello, in a girl's voice coming from the woods. 
She couldn't see anything, but she replied back, confused, saying hello back. Whatever it was ended up saying, can somebody help me? And that's when she got the chills and ran as fast as she could back inside our house. Right before she entered the house, she said she heard it again, with the voice getting closer asking for help, but instead of a normal girl voice, it turned into a girl voice. That didn't even sound real, and she couldn't explain the change in the voice. Plus, she said afterwards, thinking about it, that her voice sounded familiar, but couldn't point out whose voice. Why I believe she wasn't bullshitting is because two years living here, we've never talked about things like this. And when she rushed inside, she startled me because her face was in shock and she was breathing heavily, like I thought she'd seen something or heard a gunshot. I don't know. My question is, she thinks it was a skinwalker, because who be out at 3 a.m. asking for someone to help them in the woods? What do you guys think? I also read online that you aren't supposed to interact nor share the encounter you had about a skinwalker. She will be all right this one time sharing the story, I hope. For the past few nights, I've been kept awake by an unsettling noise. Something heavy moving across the roof. It's an old house, and every creak or groan it makes is familiar to me. But this, this was something different, something alien. It was heavy, rhythmic, almost like footfalls. In an attempt to understand the nature of the noise, my boyfriend agreed to go up on the roof during the day. We reasoned that if it was an animal, maybe it had left some traces behind. Plus, we could judge the weight of the creature based on how the roof responded to his weight. As he moved, I listened from inside, comparing the signs. What we discovered was unsettling. Whatever was on our roof at night was significantly heavier than my boyfriend. Wolves had been spotted in our area recently, a pair seen trotting down the road one evening, their eyes reflecting in our headlights. But even a wolf wouldn't weigh more than my boyfriend. What was prowling our roof at night was much heavier. Then, a few nights ago, we heard something that chilled us to our cores. A barking sound that seemed to move swiftly across our yard. We heard it clearly despite being inside with the TV on. There was something off about the sound, something that didn't sit right with us. It was unlike any dog's bark we'd ever heard. It was deeper, more guttural, and it had an unnerving quality to it that I couldn't put my finger on. The following morning, we found deep, large paw prints around our house and leading onto the roof. The prints were unlike any I've seen before, larger than those of a wolf, with longer claw-like indentations. Now we're left wondering, what creature is haunting our home? What prowls on our roof at night, watches us with unseen eyes, and barks with an eerie, otherworldly tone? The fear has seeped into our everyday lives, tainting every creak of the old house, every rustle of leaves in the yard. We've taken turns staying up at night, hoping to catch a glimpse of the creature. We've installed cameras around the property, their red lights blinking in the darkness. Yet every morning we find nothing but those large clawed footprints, a haunting reminder of our nocturnal visitor. One night my boyfriend suggested we venture out when we heard the sound again. Armed with a flashlight and his grandfather's old shotgun, we cautiously stepped outside. The yard was bathed in moonlight, the long shadows twisting and coiling like serpents. The barking started again, echoing through the silence of the night. We followed the sound, our hearts pounding in our chests. As we rounded the corner of the house, the flashlight beam fell onto the roof. What we saw in that moment, illuminated in the harsh white light, will forever be etched into my memory. A massive creature larger than any wolf, its body covered in dark, matted fur. It had glowing red eyes, and it was staring right at us. Its lips pulled back in a snarl, revealing sharp, glistening teeth. We scrambled back inside, locking every door, every window. We huddled in the living room. The image of the creature seared into our minds. We haven't been able to sleep since. We're still trying to make sense of what we saw, still trying to understand what this creature is. But one thing is clear. We're living in its territory, and it knows we're here. Our peaceful home now feels like a prison. And every night, 
as the heavy footfalls start on the roof, we're reminded of the terror. I remember a chilling story that was shared with me by my uncle and my dad. It happened during one of their jobs near a dense wooded area. It all began when my uncle mysteriously vanished, leaving my dad bewildered. Concerned for his brother's safety, my dad started searching the woods, desperately trying to locate him. And then, amidst the eerie silence of the forest, my dad stumbled upon my uncle frantically running around. Naturally, my dad was taken aback and demanded an explanation. What the hell are you doing? he exclaimed. But my uncle, his face etched with a mixture of fear and confusion, responded with something that sent shivers down my spine. I swear to God I heard someone calling my name out here, and I was trying to find out where it was coming from. That story has always haunted me. It's unsettling to think that such experiences are not uncommon. The idea of hearing phantom voices in the woods calling out to unsuspecting souls continues to send a chill down my spine. It's as if the forests hold secrets, whispering their mysteries into the ears of those who dare to listen. I have a story to share with you that left me quite intrigued. It involves my neighbor and a rather unexpected visitor. It was on January 6th or 7th of this year when this incident took place, and it's something that still gives me chills when I think about it. My neighbor, an elderly woman who lives about three miles away from me near Highway 101, had a startling encounter. She recounted that Bigfoot. Yes, you heard that right. Bigfoot paid her a visit on her back porch. Now, we do have quite a few bears in the area and at first she assumed it was one of them causing the commotion. But when she went to investigate the noise, she realized it was something far more astonishing. Standing just five feet away, she caught sight of a silhouette unlike anything she had ever seen before. It wasn't a bear. She was certain of that. This figure, towering at five feet seven in height compared to her husband, had distinct features that set it apart. She was particularly struck by its large and thick neck, a feature she hadn't associated with Bigfoot before. It was an unexpected detail that caught her attention. As she observed the creature rummaging through her garbage can, she couldn't help but feel a mix of awe and curiosity, Bigfoot right there on her porch. The encounter was both exhilarating and unsettling for her. She mentioned that she and her husband have no dogs, so there were no other distractions or explanations for what she saw. I had heard tales and legends of Bigfoot before, but this first-hand account from someone I know left me amazed. The fact that Bigfoot would venture so close to human habitation, even in our quiet neighborhood, made it all the more captivating. It made me wonder how many other extraordinary encounters might have happened in our vicinity without our knowledge. Steve, another neighbor who relayed this story to me, mentioned that sightings of Bigfoot in our area weren't unheard of. However, this particular visit to my neighbor's porch added a new layer of intrigue and speculation to the ongoing mysteries surrounding this elusive creature. As for me, I find myself walking around with a newfound sense of wonder and excitement. Who knows what other extraordinary creatures or phenomena might be lurking just beyond our backyards. It's a reminder that there are still mysteries in the world waiting to be unraveled, and I can't help but be captivated by the possibilities. I have a fascinating story to share with you one that happened to a man named John. It was a memorable evening when he and his wife decided to spend some time at Rooster Rock State Park in Oregon, right by the majestic Columbia River. Little did they know that their peaceful fishing trip would take an unexpected turn. It was around 2 a.m., and John found himself alone at the fishing inlet while his wife peacefully slept in their tent. The full moon illuminated the surroundings, creating an eerie yet beautiful atmosphere. As he cast his line, he heard a piercing and mournful scream that seemed to come from a distance. The sound sent shivers down his spine, filling the air with an unsettling presence. 
Curiosity got the better of John, and he turned his gaze in the direction of the scream. Till Finishment, finishment, just ten feet away, stood a massive figure that could only be described as a ten-foot-tall Bigfoot. The creature didn't seem to pay any attention to John, its gaze fixed across the river. Rooster Rock, being known as a potential crossing point for Bigfoot, added a layer of credibility to this extraordinary encounter. As John stood frozen, he couldn't help but notice the creature's eyes. In the moonlight, they shimmered like silver dollars, eight inches apart, glowing with an intense fiery red. It was a sight that sent chills down his spine, filling him with a mix of fear and awe. Tannik started to take hold of him, but then something inexplicable happened. A message of peace and non-aggression echoed in John's mind, as if telepathically communicated. It was a calming presence, urging him to maintain a sense of peace and to back away slowly. He listened to the message, turned around, collected his fishing gear, and started to retreat. The encounter had left him in a state of shock and disbelief. In a day, as John packed up his belongings and left in his boat, leaving his wife behind in the tent, completely unaware of what had just transpired. Later, when she woke up and discovered her husband missing, she sought help from a friend to search for him. Little did she know that John had been arrested, a consequence of the encounter's aftermath. As unbelievable as it may sound, the couple returned to the site later, driven by a need for answers. Their disbelief turned into astonishment when they discovered deep and wide tracks, measuring 17 and 20 inches in length. It was evidence that something extraordinary had indeed occurred that night. John, now eager to share his story, expressed his intention to return and recount his experiences when he finds the time. However, he chose not to disclose his last name or any contact information for verification purposes leaving his tale to be shared solely through word of mouth. This encounter with the enigmatic Bigfoot left John and his wife forever changed. Their perspective on the world forever expanded. It serves as a reminder that there are still mysteries lurking in the shadows, waiting to be explored and understood. I've been a police officer in Salem City for over ten years now and I've heard all sorts of strange stories from the locals. But one particular report still sends shivers down my spine whenever I think about it. It happened in the early spring of 1992, and it concerned a man named Dan and his girlfriend who were driving down Vitti Springs Road at around 10 p.m. Dan and his girlfriend were heading southwest of Salem when they saw something that they couldn't believe. A Bigfoot was standing in the middle of the road, holding a large plastic garbage bag. The creature seemed just as startled as they were, and dropped the bag before running off into the darkness. Curiosity getting the better of them, the couple checked the bag and found it filled with old coffee cups. They immediately reported the sighting to the police, and the cups were turned over as evidence. The witness kept some of the cups as a gag, but the rest were handed over to the museum for further study. The witness described the creature as black, standing on two legs, with ape-like features and no neck. It looked surprised when it saw them and then squawked before running away. It was a chilling experience, and I couldn't help but wonder what other strange creatures might be lurking in the shadows of our city. I decided to check the area around where the sighting happened, and I talked to a bookkeeper at a nearby furniture store. The bookkeeper had 20 acres of land nearby and had never experienced any problems or heard anything unusual in the past. However, he did mention that he heard strange howling sounds the year before. The encounter with the Bigfoot may seem like a wild story, but I believe the couple's account. There are still so many mysteries in this world, and we have yet to uncover all of them. As for me... I will continue to keep an open mind and investigate any reports that come my way, no matter how strange they may seem. I was admitted into a peculiar psychiatric facility in Texas due to my severe depression and uncontrolled heroin addiction. The facility, an impressive castle-like structure hidden within a dense redwood forest, was financed by my well-off parents. 
Ever since my stay there, I've been on a relentless quest to discover the truth about this facility. My suspicions of its involvement in McUltra, coupled with a peculiar encounter I experienced during my stay, fuel my obsession. Despite my rigorous research, I have unearthed scant information about this enigmatic institution, save for its location and a brief article about its inauguration in the 1940s. My parents, perhaps wanting to bury the past, have remained tight-lipped about the facility, leaving me in the dark. The primary reason behind my persistent investigation lies in a disturbing encounter I had within the facility's boundaries. Despite the facility's stringent surveillance, I distinctly recall wandering into the forest at midnight under the eerie glow of a full moon. I remember following some inexplicable presence until I reached a clearing it was there that I saw it, a towering figure draped in shadows with a gaunt, almost skeletal figure, in skin as pale and translucent as moonlight. At first, I thought it was a hallucination, a side effect of the potent medication they had me on. But then it turned towards me, revealing deep-set eyes that shone a brilliant red in the moonlight. I was petrified, frozen in place, by an overwhelming sense of dread that washed over me. The creature was unlike anything I'd ever seen, more akin to a Sasquatch from folklore than any animal known to man. Even now I'm unsure if that encounter was a hallucination brought on by my medication, or if I had been an unwitting participant in some Mike Ultra experiment. The memory of that eerie encounter and the creature's terrifying gaze continued to permeate my nightmares, driving my obsession to uncover the truth about the facility and what I experienced there. I am Josh, a park ranger stationed in the beautiful Yosemite National Park. It has always been my dream to protect and preserve the natural wonders of this place. Little did I know that one fateful night would forever change my perception of the park. It was a calm evening, and I was patrolling the vast wilderness, keeping a watchful eye on the park's visitors. As I made my rounds, I noticed an unusual stillness in the air, as if nature itself was holding its breath. I couldn't shake off the eerie feeling that something was amiss. As I continued my patrol, I stumbled upon a narrow path that seemed unfamiliar. Curiosity got the better of me, and against my better judgment, I decided to follow it. The path led me deeper into the heart of the park, away from the bustling crowds, and into the embrace of nature's secrets. The further I walked, the thicker the air became, filled with a strange scent that sent shivers down my spine. It was an odor I had never encountered before, a putrid stench reminiscent of rotting flesh. It clung to the very fabric of the forest, making each step more unbearable than the last. Just as I was about to turn back, a silhouette emerged from the shadows, towering over me with an otherworldly presence. The figure was impossibly tall, its limbs elongated and disjointed. It stood before me, its eyes burning like hot coals in the darkness. Fear paralyzed me as I gazed into those fiery depths, feeling as if it could peer into the depths of my soul. Without warning, the figure beckoned me forward, guiding me with an unspoken invitation into a nearby cave. Reluctantly, I followed, compelled by an unknown force that I couldn't resist. The cave was a labyrinth of shadows, the air thick with the same nauseating odor that had accompanied the figure. The walls seemed to close in around me, suffocating me with an overwhelming sense of dread. Suddenly, as if releasing its grip, the figure dropped me onto the cold cave floor and vanished into the darkness. My heart raced and I scrambled to my feet, stumbling my way out of the treacherous cavern. I emerged back into the night, gasping for breath and covered in cold sweat. The figure was gone, leaving only lingering questions and an indescribable sense of unease. Little did I know that while I was entangled in that surreal encounter, my father was battling his own demons. News reached me that very night, as I emerged from the depths of the cave, that my father had suffered a fatal stroke. 
The world around me seemed to collapse, and grief consumed my every thought. Since that night, I have been plagued by the memories of that encounter and the untimely loss of my father. Yosemite, once a place of solace and wonder, has become a haunting reminder of the strange and unexplained. I continue my duties as a park ranger, but the shadows now hold a deeper meaning, and the unknown lurks just beyond the reach of my understanding. The anticipation in the Thompson family was palpable as we embarked on our long-anticipated camping trip to Yellowstone National Park. It was a dream vacation, an escape from the hustle and bustle of our busy lives. Tom, my husband, Sarah, our two kids, Emily and Ethan, and I were eager to immerse ourselves in the heart of nature and create memories that would last a lifetime. The first few days of our trip were like scenes from a dream. We explored pristine wilderness, hiked along scenic trails, and marveled at the grandeur of the park's natural wonders. Our evenings were filled with campfire stories that made us laugh and shiver with delight. We gazed at the star-studded sky, feeling like a small part of something much greater. But then on the fourth night, as we gathered around the campfire to roast marshmallows, an airy silence fell upon the forest. The sounds of the night, once comforting, grew muted and distant. Our jovial conversation dwindled, replaced by a gnawing sense of unease. Suddenly the tranquility was shattered by a barrage of strange, inhuman noises that pierced the night. Low, guttural growls resonated through the trees, and the snapping of branches echoed ominously. Our once familiar surroundings had transformed into something sinister, something we couldn't comprehend. Fear gripped us, and we huddled together, clutching our flashlights and knives, hoping the light would ward off the growing unease. In the shroud of darkness, we glimpsed massive, shadowy figures lurking at the edge of our campsite. Our hearts raced as we realized we were not alone in this remote part of the park. Panic set in as we recognized the looming threat, a formidable predator whose nature remained a mystery. With adrenaline surging, we made a split-second decision to flee our campsite. I want to share my story. Approximately five years ago, I was driving home from my job as a correctional officer at Cook County Jail in Chicago, Illinois. My shift ended at 11 p.m., and it took me approximately 35, 45 minutes to drive home from work. As I always did, I would call my wife and let her know I was safe from my shift, and typically she would keep me company on my Bluetooth while I drove home. Every night when I drove home, I took Midlothian Turnpike a few blocks up the exit of the expressway. Midlothian Turnpike will also lead you to the location of Bachelors Grove Cemetery. Please research Bachelors Grove Cemetery. As I drove past Bachelors Grove Cemetery, a figure which I can only describe as a pterodactyl flew over across my car and across the road into the woods on the other side of the street. I screamed as I thought I was going to hit something. My wife is still on the phone now, yelling, asking me what is going on and if I was okay. I had to get my bearings together, but I was so scared. I thought about stopping at the gas station ahead, but I knew I was close to home. When I got home, we got a good laugh about it. Two days ago, I told this story to my boss. He asked if I knew what what Mothman was. I heard of it, but wasn't familiar on its stories. When I look back now, many things happened that I believe may have been a result of my encounter. I probably won't talk about this again, as I don't expect anyone to believe me, and I don't want to feed it any energy to come back. Thank you for being open-minded. If any of them here would like to know more or know someone who may want this info, please message me here. The legend of the skinwalker has always sent shivers down my spine. As a member of the Algonquin tribes, it's a tale I've heard countless times. It speaks of a sinister entity that can take the form of any creature it desires. It's said to be an evil witch, punished for using forbidden magic and doomed to roam the earth, sowing discord and feeding on fear. 
In our tribe, the skinwalker and the wendigo are often spoken of in the same breath. Both are embodiments of our darkest fears. The wendigo, a creature born of insatiable greed and cannibalism, is a grim reminder of the dangers of letting our desires overcome us. Despite the passing of generations, the terror these entities evoke remains ever-present a shadow cast upon our people, especially when venturing into the vast, untamed wilderness of our ancestral lands. Not long ago, a group of ten friends, outsiders, all of them, decided to camp in these very woods. They crossed paths with me on their way. I noticed their excitement, their laughter echoing through the trees, a stark contrast to the quiet reverence we natives held for this land. I felt it was my duty to warn them about the legends about the skinwalker and wendigo that lurked in our folklore. Their response was nothing short of mockery. They laughed it off, joking about these fairy tales, their voices filled with youthful arrogance. I watched them go, a sinking feeling in my heart. Their first night was filled with joy, but as the days passed, their laughter faded, replaced by an eerie silence. The tranquil forest began to whisper tales of terror. They reported strange noises, horrifying visions, and an unsettling feeling of being watched. Then, one by one, they began to disappear. Despite the growing fear, they refused to leave, their pride blinding them to the dareness of their situation. One night after the last embers of their campfire had died out, they all vanished. It was I who found their abandoned campsite. Tents torn apart, their belongings scattered haphazardly, and a chilling silence hanging in the air. Search parties were formed, and after days of combing the forest, we found them. Their lifeless bodies were a grim testament to their hubris. The legend of the skinwalker and the wendigo is not just a story. It's a warning, a lesson about respect and humility. These friends learned it too late. Their fate serves as a chilling reminder to all who dare to venture into these woods, ignorant and dismissive of the ancient spirits that dwell within. It was back in the early summer of 1991, mid-June or perhaps early July, that something truly strange happened on my family's 300-acre property located about a mile north of Cape Perpetua, near the coast of Yahats, Oregon. I was driving down our private access road. There were some hikers further ahead, enjoying the tranquility of the dense woods surrounding us. That tranquility was abruptly shattered when a massive creature darted across the road in front of them, disappearing into the underbrush as quickly as it had appeared. I can still remember how the sight of it took my breath away. It was enormous, about nine feet tall, covered in long brown hair. But what was most astounding was the speed at which it moved. One moment it was there, standing in stark contrast to the lush green of the forest, and in the blink of an eye it was gone, swallowed by the foliage. No sound accompanied its passage, no rustling of the leaves, no crackling of the twigs beneath its weight, and there was no distinctive odor that lingered in its wake. The creature left behind a single blurred footprint. I didn't bother to measure it. The details of the print were far too vague to make out any useful information. But the sight of it, so striking in its alien quality, cemented the reality of what I'd just witnessed. The sighting occurred in the late afternoon, around 4 p.m., with plenty of summer daylight left. At my nearby trailer, I kept four dogs, all chained to prevent them from wandering off into the wilderness. Despite their keen senses, they'd shown no signs of being disturbed by any unusual presence in the forest. Intrigued and more than a little unnerved, my father and I decided to explore the area where the creature had vanished. There, deep within the forest, we discovered a small pile of oyster shells. They didn't seem old enough to be remnants of an old Indian shell mound, despite those being common in coastal areas. Confused and fascinated, I decided to share my experience with a friend of mine, a park ranger named Time. He was a seasoned man, someone who had spent years patrolling the dense woods and had seen more than his share of wildlife. 
Despite being initially skeptical, Tim listened to my story and agreed to investigate the unusual find of oyster shells. I'm not sure what I expected him to say. Maybe I hoped he would confirm my suspicion about having seen Bigfoot, or perhaps dismiss it as an encounter with a rogue bear. But Tim, with his calm demeanor and sharp eyes, simply stated, The woods hold more secrets than we can fathom, Steve. We might never know what truly happened here. But that's okay. It's part of the magic. That encounter left me with a profound sense of... Back in August of 2000, I witnessed something I still struggle to believe. I'm Jason Schaefer, a detective, and I'm about to share a peculiar encounter I had around 1.53 a.m. during a pursuit of three suspicious men in a vehicle. Blocking my path in the middle of the road was an eight to nine foot tall upright figure. I slammed on the brakes and stepped out of my car, needing to reassure myself that I wasn't seeing things. As soon as I did, the creature bolted probably at a speed of 40 to 50 miles an hour, and was clear across the highway in a blink. For more than half an hour after this encounter, I couldn't stop my hands from shaking so much that I couldn't even hold a cup of coffee. That location has been off my travel routes ever since. Many speculate that the entity I saw was some form of Bigfoot, but given the lack of other reported sightings at the time, I can't definitively say that's what it was. However, I've heard numerous accounts of what's being termed shadow people around the Atlanta area. This leads me to believe that many folks aren't reporting their encounters due to fear of ridicule or humiliation. Some may not even recognize the existence of these entities. I'm convinced there are countless people who've experienced paranormal phenomena without realizing it due to a lack of prior knowledge about these occurrences. That's the reason I'm sharing my story here. Feel free to share my experience with your friends and family, but I urge you to keep an open mind. Thanks for taking the time to read about my encounter. I've got this buddy who spent a few years working as a forest ranger in the United States. He has spun some spine, chilling yarns about his findings on the job, leading me to a startling realization. Either all forest rangers are in cahoots, sharing elaborately conceived tales for anyone curious about their work, or the wilderness is a trove of more mysteries than we can fathom. One tale that continues to occupy my mind, Brent, free, is about this bizarre pit he discovered deep in the forest. He mentioned receiving reports about an excavated pit that fellow rangers had stumbled upon while patrolling, just a gigantic gaping hole in the middle of the woods. Being the curious type, he decided to investigate, and sure enough, he found the pit, a cavity in the earth about the size of a car, with an oddity at its center, a vintage record player in seemingly perfect condition. My buddy brought the relic back to the office, and the rest of the team filled the pit in. The record player became a forgotten mystery when no one came forward to claim it. A week later, they faced a reprimand from their superiors for failing to fill the pit, news that left my friend bewildered. He knew he and his colleagues had done so. However, they were met with undeniable evidence to the contrary when they returned to the site. The pit was there untouched without a trace of the soil they had used to fill it. The only change. The vintage cigarette case now lay in its center. My friend once again filled the pit, half assuming that there was some mischief at play, maybe some ritualistic actions. But it didn't add up. Again, nobody inquired about the cigarette case. So naturally, he kept it. Days later, reports came in. The pit was back. The rangers were tired of the games. They took a small security camera with them, intent on catching the pit excavator. What they found this time was a small, old, leather-bound notebook. They installed the camera, filled the pit, and left. The pit never returned. Whoever was digging it seemed to have been scared off by the camera. However, the curious part wasn't over. My friend had the collected items examined, confirming their authenticity in remarkable condition. A peculiar way for a vintage collector to store their treasures. But the strangest discovery was in the journal. A newspaper clipping dated April 17, 1972, and one cryptic phrase. It worked. 
Another story involves a kid who emerged from the woods one day. He was slightly dirty, standard for a child after a day's play. Clad in a t-shirt and jeans, there was nothing odd about his appearance. The rangers found him and took him to one of their offices to inquire about his parents, his presence there. He said he had lost his family while chasing a beetle in the woods. The kid seemed normal, but he had a unique accent, making English sound like a well-learned second language. When asked for his parents' names, he replied with 98 into 54. They probed for their real names, but he just kept repeating those alphanumeric sequences, confused by their questions. They tried to ask him for his parents' contact numbers, how long he'd been lost, or any other identifying details, but to no avail. All the questions seemed foreign to him. Suddenly, the boy announced that he had made a severe mistake, bolted from the office, and disappeared into the forest. The rangers pursued him, but he was too swift. They searched the forest extensively, but found no trace of him. Search and rescue teams were summoned. Missing posters were distributed. Social media shares were circulated, and the police even got involved at some point. But the child was never seen or heard from again. After searching extensively and covering as much terrain as possible, they found nothing, not even a footprint. Everyone braced for the inevitable moment when worried parents would show up, asking about their missing child. But no one ever came. As time passed, the search efforts waned. The boy's story became a missing person's report with only a generic physical description to go by and the unusual names of his alleged parents. 98 into 54, among the rangers, it became somewhat of a taboo topic. Nobody wanted to ponder the grim possibilities of where a child lost in the woods might have ended up. Yet even with the scant hope of ever uncovering the truth, my friend holds a firm belief. That boy was not merely lost, but somehow purposefully placed in the woods. He entertains the possibility that the kid might have been a product of an extraterrestrial entity masquerading as his parents. It's a peculiar case indeed, and one shrouded in an aura of suspicious activity. After the search died down, any mention of the incident on social media was pulled down. Documentation that had been released was suddenly redacted. Everything about the case... To this day, reeks of fishiness. But these are just two tales from my friend's time as a forest ranger. There's no shortage of eerie stories he's shared with me over the years, and whether it's all a grand inside joke amongst rangers, or the woods truly hold inexplicable mysteries, I may never know. All I do know is that his accounts have left me with a newfound sense of wonder and a dash of unease about what lies hidden in the depths of our forests. My mom has worked at a small rural hospital for about six years now. She is the ER receptionist, so she is the first person you see when you come into the emergency room, the one to give you all the paperwork to fill out and such. Throughout these six years, she worked mostly nights, 7 p.m. to 7 a.m., and has seen quite the cast of characters the town has to offer. Every transient druggie and local has passed through that lobby, and she has seen each one, at least twice. But one night, she encountered something she had never seen before, or again since. Back in the first year, my mom was quick to get the hang of things, so she was left alone to work the counter. The ER faced the parking lot so she could see people coming in from far away and anticipate their moves. One night at about 2 a.m., she was working on her computer, looked up, and was surprised to see two people standing there, a man and a woman just standing there staring at her, and she stared back. The parking lot was dark, no car in sight, and they just appeared. After a long moment, they came into the lobby and went right up to the desk. My mom said the alarm bell started going off in her head that something wasn't right. For one thing, they were very tall. The desk my mom sat at would come up mid-chest to an average person. With these people, my mom could see the pelvic bone of the woman. They were dressed for hot weather because it was summer. They were also very skinny, and my mom emphasized this, very dry-looking. But they didn't look like your typical druggies. The woman kept stroking her neck with long fingers, saying she had a sore throat. 
my mom, for the first and only time, didn't say a word. She just looked at them. A word kept repeating in her head, Stragoy. As my mom looked at them, the woman looked to the man, looked back at my mom, then to the man again, the whole time just smiling and stroking her throat, and said to the man, Do you think she will let us through, or should we go somewhere else? My mom stayed silent as the woman repeated the pattern of looks. Then they both smiled at my mom and left. Almost after, my mom texted me asking if vampires needed permission to enter places like hospitals. I told her, since she was technically the person to say, who went back to the ER, they would need her permission. We both knew that Stregoi was a type of Romanian vampire mythos, and that was the word she kept hearing in her mind. She has never seen that couple again, and we still talk about what happened. And it does make me wonder when I hear about stories of black-eyed children and other tales of vampires, what did she see that night? And how close was she to something unreal? This happened to me and my friend around 9.30 p.m. on a Saturday, if I recall. I live in an area where not much goes on and is pretty safe for the most part. Anyways, me and my friend are dumb teenagers, both male, that love urban exploring. Our favorite sites to explore are tunnels. Around 7.30 p.m. one night, me and my friend were exploring some sites around the park two blocks away from our house, full of small tunnels to explore. We felt a little weird because we felt as if we weren't alone. There were a couple of disc golfers, but we had just watched them leave. So at this point, the park was completely empty. My friend and I were just exiting a small tunnel to get back to the park as we were waiting for the disc golfers to leave so we could go to the next secret spot, which were train tracks that are sometimes in use. To get into the train tracks, you have to go through an off path in the woods that has a few curves, so it was hard to see. My friend lead the way. A few seconds later, I thought I had lost him, so I yelled his name. Here's when things got weird. I heard what seemed almost like a distant yell or shout from the train tracks. I thought he had sped up, so I jogged up ahead and eventually ran into my buddy that was just around a curvy turn. I asked him if he was okay, and he replied yes, like nothing had happened. A little suspicion ran through my mind, so I asked him if he had yelled at me from the tracks and had come back to get me. Shockingly, he didn't. He was waiting for me, just at the turn, and he also said he heard the yell. Well, my friend and I are idiots. Instead of going back, we quietly continued to the tracks when we got up to the bridge with the train tracks. There was absolutely no one or nothing up there. Although I felt like we were being watched from the trees or something, I let my friend know about this feeling, and we quickly stopped throwing rocks into the creek and headed back to the park. I knew something was wrong as we were leaving. I just couldn't put my finger on it. We played around on the basketball court at the park before we left. Due to the creepy vibe, my friend and I decided it was best to take the main road back instead of the shortcut through the woods that led to our neighborhood. It was around 9.30 now. My friend and I were talking about what we should do all night because he was spending the night. The park has a soccer field across the street from it, so it has two gravel parking lots that are sort of hidden by the trees. As we were walking past one of the gravel lots, I felt what seemed like a warning from my body. I passed it off as nothing, but as we crossed the street from the gravel lot, here's where things started getting really creepy. I could see someone come out of the shadows of the gravel lot. They had appeared to be wearing very dark clothing and a hoodie to cover their face. I was throwing red flags everywhere. The way that they came out of nowhere was so subtle and perfectly timed. It felt as if they were waiting for us to cross, to start following us. My friend hadn't seemed to notice the strange figure. I told him to jog up ahead a little. He seemed confused, so I pulled him close to me and told him what had just happened. He seemed anxious, so we picked up the pace a little. Every once in a while, I would look over my shoulder to see where he was. Every time I looked, he would be at least three feet closer to us. I could hear the figure's eerie breathing. Thank God we were close to an alley shortcut that no one really uses but me and my friends. To get to it, you go up a little hill left of the street. I saw this as an opportunity. 
I mumbled to my friend, usually Allie. He quickly nodded, yes. The second we made it to the hill, we casually jogged up ahead to the alley. I told my friend to wait for a second. I peeked over to the street from the alley, and there I saw them. What appeared to be a man in his thirties was making his way towards us very quickly. I could see his eyes now. They were staring directly at me with an evil look. I told my friend to bolt up the damn alley to his house, which was connected to the alley. We had never ran so damn fast. We made it up to the street and take a sharp turn to the left. We had lost him at this point. We sprinted through his front door and locked every single entrance. We turned off all the lights and hid for what felt like an hour. Thank God he was nowhere to be seen. I have never seen this person ever again, and I hope not to. When I was a kid around seven years old, my grandma would often take my sister and me swimming at the river. I can remember one incident as clear as day, and it still sends shivers down my spine. Grandma, always engrossed in her Facebook scrolling, rarely paid close attention to our antics. My sister and I weren't accomplished swimmers, yet we loved the water. One day, while we were splashing around, a group of older kids approached us. They dared us to venture into the deep end of the river, and despite our limited swimming abilities, we took up the challenge driven by youthful naivety. As I was wading deeper into the river, I saw what I thought was my sister struggling in the water. But something was off. Even though my sister was smaller than me, the figure in the water seemed larger, more ominous. Despite the fear creeping into my heart, I instinctively wanted to help. But as I took a step toward her, the riverbed dropped off sharply into the deep end, and I found myself drowning. Just when I was sure I wouldn't make it, the older kids yanked me back to the shallower water, saving me from what could have been a tragic accident. Meanwhile, my grandma was blissfully unaware of the near catastrophe, her eyes still fixed on her phone screen. It's the aftermath of the incident that still haunts me. My sister had somehow reappeared, safe and unharmed, oblivious to the horrifying scene that had just transpired. But the thing that I can't shake off is the fact that the struggling figure I saw in the water was not my sister. Not only did the size not match up, but the cold, unblinking death stare that she, or rather it gave me, is still etched in my memory, and its disappearance was just as sudden and inexplicable as its appearance. There was no way my sister could have swum that fast or disappeared that quickly. So what did I see in the river that day? A trick of the light, a figment of my imagination, or something more sinister. I guess I'll never know. But one thing's for sure, it wasn't my sister. Growing up, I was always drawn to the mysterious, the eerie, and the unexplainable, cryptids, paranormal activities, and monsters that lurked in the shadows, held a fascinating allure for me. Much of this curiosity was stoked by a story my father would often tell me. The tale is an important piece of my childhood and a kernel for my interest in the supernatural. My father grew up in the scenic expanses of Oregon, a place replete with lush woods and towering mountains. One day, while he was still a young boy, he accompanied his father, my grandfather, on a trek into the forest. This particular expedition left a deep impression on my father and became the subject of a story he would recount time and again. As they delved deeper into the verdant wilderness, they were suddenly assaulted by a nauseating stench. It wasn't the earthy smell of decay or the sharp tang of wild animals. This was something else, something unfamiliar and unsettling. As they continued, they heard the ominous sound of something large moving through the trees and brush ahead of them. The source of the sound was hidden from view, concealed by the dense foliage, but they could hear it moving the crunch of branches underfoot, the rustle of leaves. Then, just as abruptly as it started, the noise ceased, replaced by the usual sounds of the forest. Driven by curiosity and perhaps a touch of fear, they decided to investigate. Upon reaching the spot, they were astounded to see branches broken off at a height that suggested a tall creature had passed through. 
It was as if something enormous, something taller than a man, had ambled through the woods, leaving only snapped branches and a lingering stench as evidence of its presence. Though the story might seem thin on specifics, the mystery it presented was enough to enthrall my young mind. Every time my father would recount it, I'd hang on to his every word, visualizing the scene and imagining what the creature could be. been. Every time I looked at the sprawling forests and majestic mountains of the Pacific Northwest, I would feel a twinge of excitement. It seemed all too plausible that something could be hiding in those vast unexplored areas. And to this day, the possibility of uncovering such hidden creatures and unraveling their mysteries continues to stoke my fascination for the unknown. My friend and I came across this amber-eyed creature on April 15, 2023, in Patterson, Texas, Waller County. It was around 11.30 p.m. when we cut through Morton Road. We backed out of that dirt road so fast and then drove south on Durkin and the left onto Royal Road, while the entire time looking over to the open field with our spotlight and the one rifle in the truck. Once we made a ride onto 362 and headed south, we began feeling a bit more relaxed. We then took it all the way south to 359 and then made a left on Highway 90 and didn't stop till we made it to our friend's house. We were coming from Patterson, Texas, where one of my other friends lives. We also like to go through that patch on Morton Road during the day because it is like off-roading. We originally thought of heading to Royal High School on Royal Road, but we instead decided to turn left and off-road at night when we drove past Morton Road. It is the reason why we were so chilled about coming across what we thought was a large dog till it turned around and stood on two legs and growled at us. Its growl was deep but low. It rattled the entire truck. One of my friends told me that the only thing they remember was the sound it made while breathing, which was that of a horse. My buddy's truck is lifted, and usually when I stand in front of the hood, it is around the high part of my chest. I'm five feet eight. But when this thing stood up, you could see most of the waist area, so it had to be taller than me. I can't give an exact measurement, because I just don't know. All I know is that it wasn't a bear. I've seen black bears before. The spotlight caught it, and it looked like my buddy's German Shepherd with amber. Looking eyes. Maybe it was a big koi dog, or koi wolf, or a bear with mange. But it was pretty tall and wide. It happened so quick. So we put it in reverse and got the hell out of there and drove all the way to Katy without stopping anywhere. Then we barricaded ourselves in it with our R-15s and shotguns, sitting there in the middle of the dark with our backs to each other for the rest of the night. We didn't leave the house until midday on Sunday to check the dashboard camera which had recorded over the entire incident the previous night. Our cell phones recorded nothing but jumble, and my buddy's dog wouldn't come near the truck as it kept whimpering around it with its tail behind its legs. The dashboard camera recorded all the data on Sunday. We went through it, and it was from when the truck was parked at our friend's house. The cell phone quality was so bad we erased it. I dropped my phone on the floor of the truck and didn't find it until Sunday afternoon. It is not something we were planning for, like most of the videos you see on the web. Monday morning came around, and we all call in sick because we refused to get out of the house until the sun was out. This obviously upset our parents, who thought we were being irresponsible, and we finally grew the courage to return to Morton Road on Monday afternoon. Our six trucks enter Morton Road off Durkin Road with high-powered semi-assault weapons, shotguns, and hunting rifles. We didn't find any tracks either which is weird because it had rained heavily the past few days, so the ground was soft and there was standing water on Morton Road. The only thing we found was this perverse stench, like something had died mixed with metallic smell, blood, and urine ammonia. The dogs we brought with us, two German shepherds and two others, were all whimpering nervously around the site like they didn't want to be there. After the incident, I spent the rest of April just reading everything I could at about dogman encounters. 
My other three friends don't want to talk about it either, and one broke up with his girlfriend of three years because he just refused to spend the weekend hiking with her through the Addicts Reservoir hiking trails. They got back together after we were able to get him to open up about it, but I'm the only one that has put this out to the public. It has been a month, and I still refuse to be out later than sundown. I don't leave the house early in the morning anymore to go to the gym at 5 a.m. In fact, I have changed my life around completely, and that includes no more before. Bed walks at night with a dog. I have installed security bars on all my first floor windows, added spotlights to my entire home, and places better security cameras. I also no longer drive through country roads even during the day especially by myself, because I feel exposed. Last week, I refused to go fishing on the Brazos River and turned down heading for the weekend to Lake Conroe. I'd always wanted to go fishing at the end of East Matagorda Bay, but to get there, one would have to off. Rode on a 4x4 four four west from Matagorda Beach on a dirt trail for about 15 miles. Yet after this experience, I'd no longer feel safe. I just want to go back to being ignorant about the things that go bumping about at night. It was a cold evening in January 2023 in Navajo Summit, Arizona. I had my two nieces with me. One was six, the other eight. I'd gone to our family cabin, waiting on my sister to return from town. The evening started at about 7 p.m., and we didn't have a key to the house. We waited for a couple of hours, and the girls eventually fell asleep in my truck. As the night continued, the temperature also dropped. I fell asleep as well. I woke around 9.30 p.m. It was very cold in the truck. I started the vehicle. As I depressed the brake pedal to start the truck, I noticed in the side mirror a face looking at me from the glow in the tail light. I hesitated to look at first, but gathered enough courage to observe it again. I saw a white face with long gray-white hair and black eyes looking at me. I freaked out. Once I started the truck, I sped off and headed to the highway, not sure if what I saw was following us. It was. I continued down the highway in a panic. After a few minutes, I felt as if something had jumped into the bed of my truck. I turned west to head towards a town called Ganado. I went as fast as I could to my parents' house. Upon reaching the turnoff, I felt it jump out of the truck and watched the same white-haired entity run along the right of Way Fence. As I pulled up to the house, I quickly carried my nieces inside. Once inside, I situated the girls for bed. Later that night, I dreamed that I walked about two miles to my aunt's house. No one was home. As I walked back home, I noticed this same white-haired thing paralleling me. I quickly ran home, went inside, and locked the door behind me, and then went to bed. As I woke the next morning, I noticed sand and dirt at the foot of my bed. I told my parents of what had happened and of what I had dreamed. Since we are native Navajo, they took me to a medicine man, and he told me that I actually sleep, walked to my aunt's house, and... When I entered the house, it followed me in. Totally freaked me out. Did I encounter a skinwalker? The medicine man refused to answer my questions, but my father is still vigilant and believed that I was the target of a native witch. The call came in on a sweltering Texas afternoon, the kind that makes the air feel heavy and the horizon shimmer with heat. I was sitting at my desk at the local police station, my boots propped up as I sipped on a lukewarm cup of coffee. The voice on the other end was tense, hurried, and it sent a shiver down my spine. It was a call I'd never expected, a call that would thrust me into the heart of an enigma that defied all explanation. Some of our park rangers are dead. Something, something unknown took them out the voice on the other end said, a tremor of fear in his words. We need your expertise, Sheriff. We need you out here in the National Forest. I knew that this was no ordinary case. With a heavy sigh, I put down my coffee and stared out the window at the blazing sun. I was a police officer born and raised in the vast expanses of Texas, but nothing could have prepared me for what lay ahead. I agreed to head out to the National Park, 
where the unforgiving terrain held secrets I couldn't even begin to fathom. When I arrived at the National Park, I was met with a somber group of officers, their expressions a mix of anxiety and determination. We were issued stun guns, a peculiar choice for a law enforcement operation. The Forest Service Administration had given us a clear mandate, capture, not kill. There was something out there, something that might be a new species of cryptid, and they wanted to be the first to have one detained. The gravity of the situation settled over us as we ventured into the dense forest, our footsteps muffled by the layers of leaves and underbrush. With every step, the feeling of being watched intensified, and the shadows seemed to stretch and twist in unnatural ways. I exchanged glances with the other officers, a silent understanding passing between us. We were venturing into the unknown, and none of us knew what awaited us. Hours turned into a day that felt endless, the tension mounting as the forest seemed to close in around us. And then, as the sun dipped below the horizon and the world was bathed in the eerie glow of twilight, we found ourselves standing before a clearing. In the center stood a figure, one that was both familiar and utterly alien. The creature was massive, its form stretched upward on two hind legs. Its arms were impossibly long, reaching the ground like a gorilla, but its spine was crooked, contorting its entire frame. Moonlight danced on its gray skin, and its eyes shone like twin orbs of light in the darkness. Its face was grotesque, a deformed mask that held no semblance of humanity. The officers around me raised their stun guns, and the air was filled with the crackling of electricity as we fired in unison. But the creature moved with unnatural speed, a blur of motion as it tackled officers to the ground. Panic surged through me as I fired my stun gun, the darts embedding in the creature's flesh. And then, almost miraculously, the creature fell to the ground, stunned by the sheer number of darts. We approached it cautiously, our breaths heavy in the still night air. Just as we began to bind its limbs, the forest erupted with movement, and a group of figures emerged from the shadows. They wore black, their faces obscured by masks, and their presence sent a chill down my spine. See operatives, no doubt about it. Step away, one of them commanded, their tone cold and commanding. This is a matter of national security. As we moved back, they pulled out a black cadaver bag, a chilling indication of their intentions. They ordered us to leave, to be silent, their threats laced with an air of finality. The weight of their words hung in the air as we retreated, the forest swallowing us whole once more. I couldn't shake the feeling that we had stumbled onto something beyond our understanding, something that was meant to remain hidden. As I drove away from the National Park, I couldn't help but glance back, my mind swirling with questions in a sense of unease that would linger long after this encounter. My grandma told me this story about Chanakis. Her mom, my great-grandmother, and her brother used to go to the river to do the laundry. She used to leave the boy on a hammock while she was busy. One day, the boy began to walk into the sugarcane plantations that were next to the river. When his mom realized and dragged him out, he was saying that some kids were offering him papaya. She told him that they were alone there and there was no one else nearby. She put him on the hammock and continued doing the laundry, but the boy kept going into the cane plantation. This situation repeated many times, but the last time she realized the boy wasn't there, she ran into the plantation and found him. She scolded him, and he was swearing again that some kids were offering him papaya. When she looked up, she could. She'd eat the canes moving, like if three people running between them. She got scared and left suddenly. Days after talking with other people, they told her that those kids could have been Chanakis that were trying to steal her kid. So she never brought him back to the river. Some days, when she was there alone, someone would throw her pebbles while she was distracted. I was sleeping in my studio and suddenly darted awake, fully alert, almost instinctual. 
A deep sense of dread and anxiety came over me as soon as I awoke, and a feeling of a presence was in my kitchen twenty feet away. It was a completely new and isolated experience. This has never happened to me. I mean, I shot up awake and felt deep dread like a draining presence. It was like a totally different sense was activated, honestly chilling. It wasn't from a nightmare. I didn't see or hear anything. I don't have depression or anxiety, nothing that would rationalize this experience. So anyways, I'm looking at the kitchen and sensing something and feeling a level of dread and anxiety I have never ever felt in my life. So I call my dog on the bed and hug him and try to block it out. I ask him to please protect me, be my guardian, and I buried my head into him just wanting this too. Class, nothing has happened since. Until... Several months later, my best friend Dog sits for me, lives in my studio for a week. Fast forward another couple months, and she hears my original story for the first time. She tells me while she Dog sat, she had that same experience. A sudden wake up on high alert and scared, anxious, and feeling something in the kitchen. I thought that was really trippy and profound and confirms I wasn't crazy. What was it? What did it want? Did it wake me, or did my own senses protect me? Did something else protect me? It's so interesting, and I wonder if any other have had stories similar to this. By the way, my dog was chilling, thank God. I would have been even more freaked out if he sensed the presence. From my early childhood through my late teens, I lived with a trio of shadowy figures that trailed me like spectral companions. Three ethereal entities, each with its own distinct form and presence, and each tied to a specific location or time of day. The first was a woman shrouded in a cape. She was the night visitor, materializing only when I was asleep. She would stand at the foot of my bed, silent and still. Her presence was unnerving, but she never did anything more than stand there, watching me from the shadows. The sight of her was a nocturnal constant, a ghostly figure looming in the darkness of my room. The second was a childlike figure that haunted our backyard, always hiding behind the starfruit tree. This one only appeared while I was cooking in our kitchen late at night. I would glance out the window and see it there, standing still and staring at me. It was a creepy sight, a small figure illuminated by the faint moonlight, always watching, never moving. The last one was the most bizarre, a man without a torso who seemed to hover around as if gravity didn't apply to him. He wasn't bound by the rules of the other two. He would follow me in broad daylight, appearing suddenly in the most unexpected places. He was a constant reminder of this spectral trio's presence, a haunting figure that seemed to linger in my peripheral vision, no matter where I was or what time of day it was. These three figures were my constant companions for many years, a trinity of shadows that seemed inextricably tied to my existence. Their presence was unsettling, yet over the years I came to accept them as a part of my life, their motives, their origins, their true nature. All remain a mystery to me, but they were a part of my world, a spectral triad that shadowed my every step from childhood to adulthood. In May 2020, one, I took a trip to New Orleans, a city famous for its rich history and tales of the supernatural. We stayed at an Airbnb, a comfortable place It felt welcoming, if not a little old. One night I woke up abruptly from a deep sleep, my gaze instinctively drawn to the bathroom. A peculiar certainty washed over me. There was someone in the bathroom. I squinted into the semi-darkness, my vision blurred without my glasses. I could discern the shape of a man standing eerily in the bathtub. His back turned to me. I blinked, rubbed my eyes, but the figure remained. I felt an icy chill run down my spine, but eventually sleep reclaimed me. On the day of our departure, all of us left the air bomb except for one girl from our group who had a later flight. Later, she confided in us about a strange experience she had after we left. 
She heard the sound of footsteps echoing down the hallway, and then a whisper as soft as the rustling of leaves. Slave. Intrigued and disturbed, she researched the history of the area where our air beam was located. To her surprise and horror, she discovered that the site was once a bustling slave trading post. The realization struck us all with a sense of dread and melancholy, a ghostly echo from the past intruding into our present. The haunting memories of our stay in that air beam blingered long after our trip, a chilling reminder of New Orleans' spectral past. The city, rich with history, had shared with us a glimpse into its dark past, a tale of sorrow and injustice that time had failed to erase. This just happened a few hours ago. I've called and reported it to the police, and I am home safely. But guess I am still in shock. Could do with putting it down in writing to process it and figured this is as good a place as any to share what happened. I finished work early today and so decided to go out for a run. I set out around 4.30 and decided my usual route, which crossed May roads, would not be very practical and so I took an alternate route along a canal towpath and some pathways through woods that I knew would be less busy. Everything was going well. I was pushing myself steady until I got to a pathway on the way back around six kilometer into the route. It is a long straight path with a canal on the left side, and on there right there is wasteland where some factories used to be, but have mostly been demolished. It has been left abandoned for as long as I can remember and is overgrown with trees and weeds, but there are the odd bits of an old factory that for some reason weren't fully demolished. As I got level with one part of the factory, which still had some old metal fire escape steps attached to it, I noticed a rough-looking guy sat on the wall with his legs hanging down. He jumped to his feet as he saw me coming and shouted something, but I couldn't make it out. As I came level to where he was, I heard him say, Wait there. Can you help me find my phone? He said this while he was running down the steps, and so I stopped as I got level with where the bottom of the steps was meaning. We were standing just a few feet apart, but with a fence in between us. It was a really old iron fence with vertical metal bars that have spikes at the top like you sometimes see around churches and things. He asked me if I would help him find his phone again, saying he had dropped it somewhere nearby, and asked if I could ring his number so he could listen for it. I felt I couldn't exactly refuse as my phone was strapped to my arm. So I said he could tell me the number, and I took my phone off my arm and unlocked it. He blurted out a phone number, but said it far too fast, and it didn't begin with seven, which made me start to feel like something wasn't right. Although I was beginning to suspect at this point I wasn't really worried, I am in pretty good shape. Had a big size and weight advantage over him, plus there was a fence between us. He didn't seem in very good physical shape and seemed like he might be homeless. I figured if he was trying to mug me for my phone, his only chance would be if he pulled a knife, so I made sure to stay a good distance away from the fence and kept my eye on where his hands were. So I told him I didn't catch any of the numbers because he said it too quickly, and he came out with another number. This time it did have seven at the beginning. I entered seven numbers, and then he started to look around and saying I can hear it. Come and help me look as he looked around at the ground. I was about to say that I hadn't even finished dialing when a much larger black guy appeared from behind a section of wall to my right. He was also really scruffy looking, and from the look of his eyes, it seemed like he was on drug. He came out saying he could hear the phone ringing over towards him and beckoned me to come through a gap in the fence and help look. The white guy then said it is ringing. Yeah? And I told him it was even though I still hadn't dialed the last digits, and now I was sure they were trying to lure me to come over to that side of the fence. After two or three times of them both beckoning me to come and help, always insisting they could hear the ring, I heard the black guy say, he's not going to fall for it. He said it in a hushed way, as if he thought I wouldn't hear, but with it being out in the middle of nowhere, I could clearly understand what he said. The white guy then started acting quite aggressive and punched a tree, telling me he needed the phone badly and how his whole life was on the phone, telling me to come and help them look for it. 
while he was punching the tree and ranting the black guy had taken a few steps away to the right meaning I couldn't keep my eyes on both at the same time. It was after 5 p.m. by this point and had gotten dark all of a sudden, which made the whole thing even more unsettling. I noticed there was a gap in the fence where some of the bars had been removed right where the black guy was heading, and I decided at that point to get the hell out of there and made a run for it. Neither of them said anything as I ran away, which makes me sure that they had malicious intentions. If they genuinely lost their phone and needed help, I would expect them to shout, where are you going, or something to try and get me to come back, but they didn't shout anything. After sprinting for a good 20-30 seconds, I turned to see if they were chasing me. They were both stood on the path around where the gap in the fence had been, but were not chasing me. They were just standing there, watching me run away. I continued running away, but kept looking back every few seconds until I was out of sight. It was at this point I got off the canal path and onto the roads. The person I spoke to on the phone to report it took my details and the descriptions, but seemed to think it wasn't anything worth worrying about, but said it will be investigated. The whole incident has left me a bit unnerved, and I'm pretty sure I won't be jogging that route alone anytime soon. Sir... My name is Megan. I am forwarding a summary of an experience that I and a friend had in August 2010. My friend and associate, Kira, and I traveled from Columbus, Ohio, to Ravenswood, West Virginia, on business. While we were there, I wanted to make a side trip to Gallipolis, Ohio, to visit relatives I had not seen for quite a while. After our meeting and presentation, we drove on to Ohio Route 7 and traveled south along the Ohio River towards Gallipolis. We had a nice, though brief, visit with my relatives. Around 6 p.m., we left their home and drove a few miles north on Rowett 7 to check into a hotel near the local airport. Around 7.30 p.m., we decided to get dinner and found a quiet restaurant so we could eat and work. After we finished, Kira needed to go to the store and pick up a few items that she forgot to pack. We headed to a Walmart that was nearby the restaurant. After we finished shopping, we were walking to the car when I noticed a woman running through the parking lot. When she reached her car, she looked back in the direction of the store and then hurriedly got into the car. I quickly looked in the same direction and saw what looked like a large bird flying above the roof of the store. It was difficult to see, but when it swooped downward the parking lot, lights would shine off of it. It looked like it was either oily or had shiny leather-like skin. Whatever it was, it had a wide wingspan. I would guess it reached eight, ten feet across. It circled above the store for about a minute, then just disappeared. We were both somewhat shocked at what we witnessed, but figured that it was just a huge bird. Since it was dark, I figured we had misjudged what it really was. We drove back to the hotel and decided to call it a night so we could get an early start on the drive home in the morning. I got ready for bed, but thought I'd watch some television first. By this time, it was around 10 p.m. or so. I must have dozed off fairly quickly because the next thing I remember is frantic knocking on my door. I stumbled out of bed and checked who it was. It was Kira, and she was obviously upset. She rushed into my room and said, It's here. What are you talking about? A little bit perturbed that she woke me up. She said that she was laying on the bed, reading when she heard something in the hallway. She got out of bed, walked to the door, and listened to what she thought were scratching sounds. After a few minutes, the sounds stopped, so she went back to bed. Not long after she lay down, she heard more scratching sounds, but from outside her window. Again, she got up and peeked through the curtains. This time, something looked back at her. Our rooms were on the second floor in the back section of the hotel, and both looked out onto a small parking lot and a large field beyond that. She could see what she described as a bald, ugly man with wings who was looking directly at her with large, bulging eyes that lit up bright red. It was there for only a few seconds. It then spread its wings while running at the same time toward the end of the parking lot and lifted off the ground like a bird. You're kidding, right? I muttered to her. Meg, I swear to God, that thing is out there, and it knows we saw it. 
I knew the only way I was going to get some sleep was to allow Kira to stay in my room. The next morning, we woke early, checked out, and drove back to Columbus. Kira didn't mention the incident from the previous night during the ride. In fact, she has still never said anything else about it. We continue to be good friends and have a very good working relationship. But I got curious. I'd never heard about the Mothman or any of the tales associated with it. I grew up in Texas and had only lived in Ohio for a few years. I moved into my mom's house after she had passed away. Her relatives lived throughout Ohio, but I had never been told any of the stories. This is the reason I'm writing to you. We were near Point Pleasant, W.V., when we had this encounter. Do you think that it is possible that this was a Mothman? I read some of your posts recently, and I'm starting to believe that Kira actually saw something supernatural. In light of the prophecies of danger that this thing is supposed to warn people about, Kira has had some bad luck and tragedy since that day. Her husband suddenly left her. She had a fire in her house, and she severely injured her leg in a fall. Could this be connected? I personally don't believe in predictions, either good or bad. But I will admit that these have been strange times since we witnessed whatever. I have been visited by otherworldly beings since 1974. I've had missing time many times over the past 48 years and have been abducted countless times. I did have one experience in 1999 that I had reoccurring dreams, a night that happened at my home in northern Wisconsin. I remember being taken from my bed, being led into my living room. I remember seeing things around me. I was shown a young girl 12 years old or so. I remember knowing that I was the child's father. I remember being so angry that I was used over years to create this abomination. I had, for as long as I can remember, maybe 25 years, kept a gun in my bed under my pillow. I had it in my hand. I remember being so angry that I was able to pull free, and I shot and killed the girl. I am a law enforcement officer. Since that day, I put it away, and I have trouble handling it. After shooting the girl, I remember being punished. I've had, had lumps in my arms that hurt and remain today. Each time that they come, they find different ways to make me suffer. All this time, I hesitate to tell anyone else about any of my sightings, but I, I did report my story to MUFON. They called me and made me feel like a criminal. It was December 2000, and the winter chill had settled in. I lived in a small town called Malala, located southeast of Oregon. The snowy hills off Hunter Road were a popular spot for hiking and exploring, and I had decided to venture out that day to enjoy the tranquility of nature. I had always been fascinated by the mysterious stories of Bigfoot, but never truly believed in its existence. Little did I know that my perspective would change drastically during that fateful hike. As I trudged through the soft snow, enjoying the crisp air and the crunch of snow beneath my boots, I stumbled upon something that would change my life forever. I found a set of tracks unlike any I had ever seen before. There were a dozen of them, each measuring 14 inches in length with an astonishing stride of five and a half feet. The elevation of the area was about 1,500 feet and the remoteness of the location added to the eeriness of the discovery. I couldn't believe my eyes. The tracks were clearly not human, nor did they resemble any known animal in the area. My heart raced as I considered the possibility that these tracks could belong to the elusive Bigfoot. I decided to follow the tracks, curious to see where they would lead. As I continued on, I couldn't help but feel a growing sense of unease. I was acutely aware of the eerie silence around me, punctuated only by the crunch of my footsteps and the occasional rustle of a bird or squirrel in the trees. Despite my apprehension, I pressed on, driven by a burning curiosity. The tracks led me deeper into the hills, and I began to wonder if I was on the verge of making a groundbreaking discovery. Suddenly, the track stopped at the edge of a small clearing. I scanned the area, searching for any sign of the creature that had left the tracks. But there was nothing, 
no broken branches, no tufts of fur, no lingering scent. It was as if the creature had simply vanished. Disappointed and feeling a mix of fear and fascination, I decided it was time to head back. I retraced my steps, making sure to take photos of the tracks as proof of my encounter. When I returned to town, I shared my story with friends and family. Some were skeptical, while others excitedly shared their own theories and stories about the legendary creature. As for me, I couldn't shake the feeling that I had come incredibly close to uncovering the truth about Bigfoot. That day in December 2000 marked the beginning of my obsession with the mysterious creature. Since then, I've dedicated my life to searching for evidence and learning all I can about Bigfoot. And though I've never come as close to the creature as I did that day, the memory of those tracks in the hills off Hunter Road continues to fuel my determination to uncover the truth. As I stared at the lifeless body of my best friend, I knew I couldn't let this go on any longer. The once peaceful town we called home had become a place of fear and nightmares. The forest surrounding it, now uninhabited by deadly, unknown creatures. We had come together as a group of hunters, determined to protect our town and families from the mysterious predators responsible for the gruesome animal attacks that had plagued our community for months. We had entered the forest, weapons in hand, prepared to face whatever horrors awaited us. But we were not ready for the cunning intelligence and ferocity of the creatures that hunted us. They picked us off one by one, their stealth and speed unmatched by any predator we had ever encountered. I was the last survivor, my friends and fellow hunters now nothing more than memories and fallen comrades. Desperate and terrified, I stumbled deeper into the forest, hoping to find a way to stop these relentless monsters. That's when I discovered it. An ancient relic hidden away in a dark, forgotten cavern. Its mysterious power seemed to resonate with the creatures, hinting at the possibility of controlling them. With newfound determination, I began to study the relic, learning its secrets and unlocking its potential. As I deciphered its ancient symbols and harnessed its power, I devised a plan to turn the creatures against one another, using their own instincts and abilities to defeat them. With a relic in hand, I ventured back into the heart of the forest, seeking out the lair of the predators. When I found them, I used the relic's power to emit high-frequency sound waves, carefully tuned to a frequency that specifically affected their hearing leaving the other forest animals unharmed. The creatures, disoriented and incapacitated by the sound, began to turn on one another, their pack mentality shattered by the unbearable noise. As the predators fought amongst themselves, I watched from a safe distance, the power of the relic protecting me from their wrath. The once fearsome creatures were now vulnerable and confused, their reign of terror coming to an end. With the last of the creatures defeated, I returned to the town, battered and bruised but alive. I carried with me the relic, a testament to the power it held and the lives it had saved. The nightmare was over, and our small town could finally begin to heal from the horror that had gripped it for so long. In the end, the ancient relic and the knowledge of the high-frequency sound waves had been the key to our salvation allowing me to overcome the deadly predators and protect the home and people I held dear. I didn't personally witness any of the sightings, but I heard about them from the police reports. Officer Linda Seabrook saw a creature that looked gargoyle-like while driving home from work on the Garden State Parkway around 7.4 p.m., she couldn't believe what she was seeing, but was sure of the dark reddish skin and scaly reptilian wings of the creature. Another police officer, Scott Kimball, had a sighting of a gargoyle-like reptilian on Route 33 near Union at approximately 4.35 a.m. He saw a creature nearly six feet tall with scaly wings protruding from its back. The creature had larger than normal eyes and canine teeth 
Officer Kimball saw the creature land briefly on an abandoned building and was able to make out its approximately five-foot-long tail. Police dispatch also received calls about sightings of a gargoyle-like creature in Cherry Hill Township at around 8.43 p.m. Witnesses reported seeing a creature nearly seven feet tall with large bat-like wings behind its shoulders. The wingspan was estimated to be around 13 feet across. There were also reports of strange flying reptilian creatures in Pensacon Township at around 3.17 a.m. Multiple witnesses called the PD to report creatures with red glowing eyes, large wings, and massive black talons. While I haven't seen any of these creatures myself, the reports are certainly intriguing. I've always loved exploring the great outdoors, and one of my favorite pastimes is hiking the trails in the Mount Hood National Forest. The vast expanse of wilderness, filled with towering trees and hidden mysteries, calls to me like a siren song. One crisp autumn day, I set out on a solo hike down Old Cat Road, a trail that meanders through a replanted area of the forest near Colton. As I walked along the path, my senses were filled with the sights, sounds, and smells of the forest. The rustle of leaves beneath my feet, the chirping of birds high above, and the earthy scent of damp soil filled the air. The beauty of the forest never failed to take my breath away. It was then that I stumbled upon something that would change the course of my hike and spark a deep curiosity within me. As I rounded a bend in the trail, I noticed a set of tracks leading out of the replanted area onto the road. The tracks were unlike any I had seen before. Large, deep impressions with distinct claw marks. Curiosity peaked. I decided to follow the tracks to see where they led. They continued along the road for a short distance before disappearing back into the trees. I hesitated for a moment, unsure if I should venture off the trail, but my curiosity won out. I stepped off the path and followed the tracks into the dense forest. The underbrush grew thicker as I pushed deeper into the trees, and the tracks became more challenging to follow. Still, I pressed on, determined to uncover the mystery of these unusual tracks. As I continued my pursuit, the forest seemed to close in around me, the shadows growing darker and more oppressive. Finally, after what felt like hours of searching, I found the source of the tracks. In a small clearing, I came face to face with a creature unlike anything I had ever seen. It was massive, standing at least eight feet tall, with dark, shaggy fur and piercing, intelligent eyes. I realized with a mixture of awe and terror that I had discovered a cryptid, a creature of legend. The beast regarded me with curiosity, as if it were just as surprised to see me as I was to see it. We stood there for a moment, locked in a silent standoff, before the creature turned and disappeared back into the forest, leaving me alone in the clearing. As I made my way back to the trail, my mind raced with questions. What was this creature? How had it managed to remain hidden for so long? And most importantly, what would I do with this incredible discovery? From that day forward, my life was forever changed. The encounter in the forest fueled a lifelong passion for cryptozoology and a quest to unravel the mysteries of the unknown. The memory of that fateful day in the Mount Hood National Forest continues to inspire me as I journey through the world of cryptids, searching for answers and unlocking the secrets of the wild. It was my best friend's birthday. We pitched tents in the backyard. Six of us went for a walk on the dirt road in the canopy. On the other side of the canopy is the Willamette River. Four of the friends kept walking further up the road. My friend and I sat down to talk in the shade. That's when rocks started to be thrown in the river. We thought our friends were trying to scare us. When we met up with them, they were mad at us because they thought we were trying to scare them by throwing rock in the water. After figuring out it was not any one of us, we were all kind of scared. As kids, we were told of bums and our drug growers on the banks of the Willamette. We were not thinking of Bigfoot at all. 
We turned and started to walk back to the yard, and there they were. One large Bigfoot standing in front about seven to eight feet tall, and two smaller ones standing behind about six feet tall. They came up from the riverside, stood in front of us, and snorted. Maybe ten seconds felt like forever, and then took off on two feet through the brush opposite from the river. I had never seen something move so fast and so quiet once they hit the brush. My friends ran. I stood frozen in fear. I believe, due to shock, I blacked out the experience for a long time. It is one of the most horrible things to go through. Who do you talk to about this stuff? No one believes the story. I have met up with one of the people that was there. He says that he doesn't remember what he saw. He just remembers everyone being really scared and running back to the yard. It's so frustrating. I wish I would have never seen it so that I wouldn't have to believe. Here is one of the creepiest encounters I've ever, which took place in the spring of 2015. It's important to the story to know that I was basically a huge jerk leading up to what happened. See, I'm a graduate student, and I was at this point about six, eight months into a new relationship with a woman named Sarah. If it matters, I'm female, and we were both around 30 at this time. The prior year before I met Sarah, my best bud from school, Josh and I had gone on a great camping road trip over spring break. This year I messed up and basically double booked myself to go camping with Josh and with my girlfriend. Because I'm a scatterbrained idiot and I got confused about what plans had been discussed, solidified. Both Josh and Sarah were justifiably really pissed off and hurt. But I had made the plan with my girlfriend first, ultimately, so I had to flake on Josh. When it came time to planning, Sarah and I picked a campground in southwestern Pennsylvania with lots of good hiking. It's at least a five-hour drive from where we live. We made reservations, and I mentioned the plan to Josh. Well, it turns out, of all the campgrounds in the region, Josh had also decided to head to that one as it connected to a long bike trail he wanted to go on. He had decided to go camping alone, so we knew Josh would be at the campground before we got there, but things were super awkward between me and him, on account of my being an asshole and him being generally a bit depressed around that time. We stayed three nights, and Josh was there for the first and second night. We'd rented out a small cabin, basically a prefab shed with bunk beds. Because it was cheap and we have a lease reactive wimpy, about rain dog, and it's sometimes easier that way, Josh was tent camping in another spot. I think Josh and I were mostly planning on avoiding each other. He was rightfully still angry. Things were awkward, and I figured he needed some space from me, but it turned out only one bathroom was open on our side of the campground since it was only early April, and most of the campground was still closed down for the season. Josh's campsite was right next to the open bathroom, so we ended up seeing him when we walked to the bathroom at night. I saw heard signs of one or two other groups on the far side of the campground, but they had their own bathroom open over there, and we never really saw them. It's a very large and forested campground, and only small sections at either end were open for the season. The second night, Josh was out in his campsite when we came through to the bathroom before bed. It was after midnight at this point. Josh seemed super depressed, and we had a very strange and awkward conversation with him. Took care of what we needed to in the bathroom and headed back to our little shed down the road. The roads in this part of the campground were basically like an inverted F with the bathroom above the top of the F. In between the two arms of the F was a stand of trees next to the main road. A small lock shower building in Josh's campsite furthest from the main road, the main road being the vertical line of the F. We were staying off the main road further down on the opposite side, so that night we'd cut past Josh's camp to get to the bathroom, but on the way back, we followed the road so as not to bother him, as he seemed in a bad mood. It was dark, and I'm easily spooked. We had the dog with us, which was somewhat reassuring, since he looked semi-tough despite being a nutcase and a wimp. But I'm looking around nervously, and as I glance over my shoulder, I think I see a man off to the side of us. 
My brain processes this very slowly as I just caught a glimpse of him as I turned my head, and it was very dark. I convinced myself my mind was playing tricks. I didn't look back and silently walked with Sarah and the dog back to our cabin. When we got back to the cabin, I thought Sarah looked a little spooked, which is unusual since she's a lot braver than me. Eventually, she says that guy was really creepy, right? So shit. He was real. I told her I saw him, but had convinced myself my eyes were playing tricks on me. But no, we both saw someone with no flashlight standing in the trees just off the road, maybe 15 feet from us. I asked if it might have been Josh. Neither of us were really convinced, but wanted to convince ourselves so we could get some sleep. And he had been wandering around being moody 15 minutes before, and it was right by his campsite. I think we didn't want to freak ourselves out any further, so we locked the cabin and didn't talk about it much more. The next morning it was pouring rain, so Josh decided to pack up and leave early instead of spending the day in the area. We shouted goodbye to him as we headed to the bathroom, and he ran around tossing shit in his trunk and trying not to get drenched. That night was a weekend, and there was a big family in the cabin next to ours, and everything felt far less spooky. But when we got back to town a day later, I texted Josh, asking him if he'd been lurking creepily in the wood. He said no. Well, I told him what we'd seen, and he said he'd seen a guy the prior night lurking in the woods without a flashlight. Same general description, which I'll get to. Same area. The guy had really creeped him out, so much so that the next day he bought the biggest maglight he could find, so he'd have more than just a pocket knife to defend himself. But he'd also mostly convinced himself it was a park ranger. Yeah, with no flashlight, let alone a vehicle. But he more or less willed himself to believe it so he could get some sleep. So, once we could no longer pretend it was Josh, Sarah and I compared notes. What we both saw, and what Josh saw the night before, was this. A tall, gaunt white man in his late 40s, with clean-shaven, sunken cheeks in the stand of trees bramble just off the road, in the space between the arms of the fit. He was wearing a raincoat, rubber boots, and a hat, and had no flashlight. He was just standing still and staring coldly in our direction. I remember his raincoat, his sunken face, and how very cold his gaze felt. In contrast, Josh is several inches shorter than whoever we saw, was not wearing a raincoat that night, which we knew because we'd just seen him. But we convinced ourselves otherwise, bearded 29 years old at the time. I should add, it wasn't raining. To be clear, where this guy was was not somewhere you'd be strolling through. It, it was a thick, brambly area. He had made the effort to move out of the road and to stay in the shadows and away from the bright bathroom light both nights. We're sure he wasn't going to the bathroom. Though we were on the women's side, you can hear the men's side clearly, and Josh had been outside in view of the bathroom doors both nights. He didn't look like he lived in the woods which is to say he appeared clean and groomed and his clothes weren't worn or dirty. Whatever he may have been doing in the middle of the night in a nearly abandoned campground with no flashlight, he was clearly making an effort not to be seen. We all discussed it and Josh ultimately called the campground to let them know. They said they'd check it out. Although my camping fees were mysteriously refunded, we never heard anything more. Josh is still a little mad at me for seeing a potential murderer lurking the woods near his tent and not doing anything. Out of curiosity, we just checked to see if anything had happened in the park. A number of people have gone missing in the state park over the years, some slightly mysteriously. Most were found downriver and believed to have fallen into the rapids on accident. I'm sure it's unrelated, but the whole place gives me the creeps, and I still can't figure out what that man was doing. So last year around November, September, I was driving home late at night, 2 or 3 a.m., from my buddy who lived on the other side of the city with my bike. I was stoned as F when I was leaving. Me and my buddy smoked a lot that evening. I had two routes in my head that time that get me home. One was 13 kilometers long through a forest. The other was a much longer route through the city around the forest. 
For info, I live in Hanover, Germany. The city is pretty much built around these big forests. I decided to go for the forest route, which was already a bad choice, since I didn't have any lights on my mountain bike, and the forest is very dark at night. But I've been driving this route often, since the other route is just a waste of time. Was an easy decision for me back then, since I'm a two meters tall male and was armed with a knife. So I'm rolling into the forest in my route trough. It was this asphalted track for inline skaters and bikers. It goes all the way trough. I'm pulling out my cell phone to activate the camera light since this was my only light source. I had and realized I forgot to charge the phone at my buddy's house. So my phone has this option when it's below 5% battery level. You can only activate the camera light for a few seconds till it turns off automatically and you need to turn it on again. Needless to say, it was quite stressful to drive like that, always the light turning on and off. It rained that night too, but not much. More like foggy, fine rain. I don't know what it's called in English, but we call it in German easel. Because of that, I only could see what was close in front of me, like 10 or 15 meters view only. Three, four kilometers in, the track takes a sharp curve. After I was taking it, I would see a white figure standing next to the road. It was dark as F late, and I'm literally in the middle of the forest. I was thinking about returning, but I decided in a matter of seconds to keep going since I had a lot speed on. I was rushing through the forest. When I spotted the figure, I couldn't see much since I was like 20 meter away, but in seconds when I came closer, I could see that it was a man in white jacket, just standing there in darkness. Like I said, my phone was keep putting out the light so I would have seen it if he had a light when my phone's light was off. So I'm going full speed towards that creepy guy standing next to the road. I was about five meter now from him, and he was just standing there motionless, like not even turning his head. Light goes out. Four meter now. Three. Two. I put the light back on and bypass him. I see him in the face. He was the most unhygienic looking man I've ever seen. Full nasty beard like a homeless guy just staring at the track. It was this moment I would feel a heavy rumble under my tires. I almost crashed. The track where the man stood was full off sticks and branches, like a barricade. I think my mountain bike tires were saving my ass that day. Needless to say, I have bike lights now and don't take that route at night anymore. I believe that a lot of people get signs before something really bad is going to happen. Two nights ago, I woke up screaming from a very lucid, horrible dream, where in the woods outside my house, I heard someone in pain calling for help. I go to them and find a naked humanoid deer creature that turned on me. I believe that thing was a skinwalker. Then last night around 3 a.m. I heard and felt what sounded like something very large hitting the side of my house. Very clearly I could tell it was happening in the area outside of my kitchen and either next to or below my kitchen window. I was in my living room sitting on the couch where there is even a wall between the living room and kitchen. But this sound was so loud it could be heard throughout the whole house. And while I was already awake, the sound scared my cats, also woke up my sleeping daughter and partner. I could feel the wall behind me and the floor vibrate, along with the dishes and kitchen cupboards rattling around from the impact. This happened at least twice, I'm certain, maybe once more. But after the second time, I was so scared, I ran to check on my family. There was about a ten-second pause between the sounds. After the dream I had, I haven't been able to sleep in fear, plus the loud noises are keeping me up too. Made sure to lock everything just in case. I'm wondering if the events are connected at all. If anyone can give me tips or help ease my mind, I'd appreciate it. The other day I was driving home, and as I came around a curve, there was an animal that I thought was a goat at first. It ran away from me and got far enough away that I couldn't see it in my headlights. And it ran across the road and hid behind a bush. 
It was smart enough to pivot around the bush as I drove by it. It was extremely pale and looked like a camel shape. It moved like a Chinese dragon and looked like it was made out of a bed sheet. If y'all have any questions, please ask. I'm seriously trying to figure out what I saw, natural or supernatural. Don't know if this helps, but I'm from North Carolina and this all happened next to a cow pasture. Wasn't a cow because they only have brown cows, no white ones. And I grew up around cows. They don't move, look like that. It was probably about four to five feet tall and about six or feet long. It was a pretty big animal. I am a female, 22. I am petite, really pale, and always messy hair. I was wearing loosened clothes, all whites. Maybe you will guess where I'm heading to. I was outside smoking while sitting on a chair in my front yard. I forgot to mention an essential detail. I live in the countryside. My street leads to fields and forests. The night here hits differently, if you know what I mean. The sky offers some great masterpieces freely to our starry eyes. So yes, I was just hyper-focusing on the sky. I just stood up and decided to take a picture. I wanted to reproduce it through painting. However, I was really disappointed by my lame camera, so I decided to head out inside to grab one of my parents' phones since their quality were better. While I was trying to take some pics, I felt a gaze on me. It was my new neighbor. She was staring at me. I was in my front garden just in front of her house. I was waiting since in my front yard there is an automatic light. It flashes at any movement and lasts for like 20 seconds. Important element. So I was only visible for a few moments. It was pitch dark again. There are no street lights where I live. So I was relieved to feel invisible. As I was finally taking mesmerized pictures, out of the blue, the flash of the phone I was holding started to light up. The moon was right on the left side of her house. Yeah, it looked like I was taking photos of her house. I heard her screaming. I put my hand on the flashlight, turned it off. I was petrified. I didn't know which option was the best. Ah, fleeing right away in my house, so reactivated the flash. Looking suspicious, B confronted her, also talking to her for the first time. And explaining the whole situation because I scared her quite often. I will explain after the other option. C, just disappearing in the dark and waiting. Okay, so I am a night owl and I love art. It is not unusual to see me outside, standing right in front of my house or in the middle of the driveway past midnight taking pictures, smoking or just contemplating. So I spooked her multiple times. I know because she said that I was the weird neighbor to someone. One day I was playing in the front yard, playing with my cat with a red light laser, obviously late at night. I accidentally lighted my laser towards one of her windows, so a flashy red light point was visible. I heard her screaming, lighted up the room. I turned it off and I glanced at her. She was looking at me and shut the curtains. Back to the story, I decided to not move and wait. Then I was like I should still continue taking pics. I heard loud voices. The front door opened. I heard them walking slowly towards their car and whispering, what was I supposed to do? I just took a last pick and headed to my house. As the flash went on, I was petting my cat. I heard her saying again, this weird chick. As soon as I closed the door, I laughed out loud. Nervous reaction. Surely I should find a way to talk to her. Reassuring her that I'm inoffensive or just remaining the weird neighbor. All right, so this takes place a little over a year ago in the north woods of Wisconsin in winter. My parents had been out of town for probably about a week, and I was dog-sitting. I was in a big old house alone, which I didn't mind too much. I couldn't drive, but I'd take long, cold winter walks through the woods a few miles to get to the grocery store. I say this to point out that I knew the place pretty well and definitely wasn't scared of the area. On one of the last days they'd be gone, I heard a strong, distinct whistle. It was at the same tempo of the sound a foghorn would make, but very high pitched. 
It was pretty loud and sounded incredibly close. I looked out the window and saw nothing and no one. I also heard about nothing, no footsteps, birds, deer, or anything else. The silence was so eerie that I could feel my heart pounding, I immediately ran to shut and lock all of the doors and windows. I stayed up about half of the night with the most unsettling feeling. I just couldn't shake like when you know that something's watching you. I also want to mention that my closest neighbors were completely out of town and I saw no footsteps the next morning except my own. I grew up in Hillsboro just down the road, and there was something that haunted me during those years. A tall, featureless figure darker than the darkest night. It appeared in my room on multiple occasions, always in a different position. Sometimes it would be crouched down in the corner, facing the wall, while other times it would lurk inside my closet, staring into its depth. These encounters left me feeling unsettled and frightened. One particular night, shortly before I was about to leave for college, the figure took on a more terrifying form. As I awoke from my sleep, I saw it bent over at a perfect 90-degree angle, its face positioned directly above mine. It started repeating the same phrase over and over again, in a haunting voice. I am here. I am here. The words echoed through the room, sending shivers down my spine. That night marked the last time I ever saw the figure. As I left for college, I hoped to leave behind the unsettling experiences of my childhood. However, the memory of that encounter remains deeply ingrained in my mind. It's both fascinating and unsettling to hear someone from the same area recounting a similar experience. To this day, I find myself reflecting on those encounters and wondering about the true nature of that mysterious figure. What was it? What did it want? The questions remain unanswered, and the memory of those eerie encounters continues to leave an indelible mark on my consciousness. It's a reminder that there are inexplicable forces in this world that we may never fully understand. I was born and raised and currently live in the very rural north woods of Wisconsin, near the U.P. border of Michigan on land that was originally, and still somewhat sparsely, populated by the Ojibwe people. I had a similar experience this past February, 2023, that I can't shake. I was solo snowshoeing an isolated trail system in the Chekomagon, Nicolette National Forest in the Lake Superior Snow Belt, not far from my home. It's a beautifully remote place that I've explored many times alone, often never crossing paths with another person. This time it was sunny late afternoon. I was again alone on a particularly scenic trail paralleling a small, fast-flowing river, which was open and only iced over on the banks, enjoying the serene scene accompanied by the sweet songs of chickadees and industrious sounds of nuthatches amplified by the cold calm. As I got further on the trail, I noticed it suddenly got very quiet, which wasn't alarming at first as the winter woods can get very silent, especially considering our high snowfall amounts that blanket the land. Then, out of nowhere, I heard a rhythmic, deep and reedy sound of a low but loud whistle through the brittle woods. I was captivated as I had never heard that sound before. It had a powerful pulse to it that I can't really describe. I am an avid birder, admittedly not an expert, but I was baffled. The noise was somewhat close when I first noticed it, but instead of being curious, I became concerned as I heard the sound getting closer to me. The sound inexplicably filled me with dread. It seemed to be traveling quickly, maybe as fast as a bounding deer, and seemed physically low, the utterance coming from somewhere just above the ground and well below the treetops. While I was out there, I rationalized that the strange vocalization must be from a raven. Ravens are year-round residents up north, so I am very familiar with them. They are highly intelligent birds with complex individualized calls that include deep sounds like croaks. However, I have never, ever 
in my four decades of living up here, have ever heard a raven utter a sound like that noise. That day I was deep in the woods and was the first person breaking trail after a big snow, so I couldn't move fast. I decided that my best course of action was to just keep going until I got to a switchback that would shorten my journey. As I paralleled the river from a ridge above dense with new pine growth, I heard the sound from what seemed to be between me and the river, maybe fifty yards maximum. I stopped and listened as it moved on and beyond, still paralleling the river. I couldn't see much ahead of me, and I did not hear any footfall of it breaking the snow. Honestly, as irrational as I felt, I was grateful to be hidden. I hauled it to the trailhead and got out of there as fast as I could. As soon as I got home, I started researching and seeking out any information on what bird or animal could have created that vocalization. Nothing I found matched that sound. To this day, I just tell myself it must have been a raven, but I know in my own small understanding of the world that it was something else. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.